Sir, uh, can you unmute your mic, sir? Kothari, uh, sir, kindly unmute the mic. Sir, kindly unmute your mic, sir. You are not able. Sir, we are not audible, sir. You kindly unmute your mic. Arish sir, I think there is some technical issue there. Uh, yes sir, uh, we are contacting him sir. We will uh, okay, get okay. him soon sir. Okay. Hello. Yes, sir. Audible now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You are audible now, sir. Uh, can you start now? Yes, yes. Hello. Can you start? Yes, sir. You can start. Sir, uh, before uh, presentation, I'll give a small introduction about our renowned uh, chief guest of today, Dr. D.P. Kothari, former Vice Chancellor, VIT Value, and former Director in Charge of IIT Delhi, Visiting Fellow, RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia, Director, Research, and Professor, SBJITMR Nagpur, former Director, Research, GPGI Nagpur, Former Director Research, MBSR Engineering College, Hyderabad. Former Director General, JBIT, Hyderabad. Former Director General, RGI, Nagpur. Former Director General, VITS, Injor. Former Vice Chancellor, VIT, Bellur. And former Director in Charge of IIT, Delhi. Dr. D.P. Kothari is an educationist and professor who had leadership positions at engineering institutions in India, including IIT, Delhi. Vishweshwaraya National Institute of Technology, Nagpur and BIT University, Vellore. Currently, he is with the Electrical Engineering Department as Honorable Adjunct Professor 
as a recognition of his contribution to the engineering education he was honored as an ieee fellow previously he was vice chancellor at the prestigious velur institute of technology dr dp gadari has served as advisor to the chancellor at bit university and prior to that he was head center for energy studies at iit delhi and principal visveshwara regional engineering college nagpur he has also been the director of iit delhi and deputy director of iit delhi he is most popularly known for his contribution to the advancements of engineering education in india he has published and presented over 842 papers in international and national journals and conferences and he has authored and co-authored 60 books including power system optimization modern power system analysis electrical machines power system transients theory and problem of electrical machines renewable energy resources and emerging technologies his research interests include optimal hydrothermal scheduling unit commitment maintenance scheduling energy conversion loss minimization and voltage control and power quality and energy system planning and modeling he is currently as a honorary adjunct professor in vit nagpur with this short introduction i invite dr dp kotari for the inaugural plenary lecture over to you sir hello am i audible sir yes sir you are audible you can start sir audible na okay yes sir let me start now so i must thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you see the whole electrical engineering started in 1885 the year in which uh, indian national congress party was born there was a fellow called thomas edison he gave bulb to the world first bulb and then he was the person who was responsible for di direct current till 1920 in 1920 came the transformer so they shifted from dc to ac and uh, the 15th august 1945 47 when we got freedom our whole country had only 1360 megawatt that is all and so late pandit nehru the first prime minister of india he started developing country in three direction one energy second technical education third was industry the first industry came that was the steel industry in uh, in the uh, in the old cp in barar that is bilai with ussr help and the first powerhouse came that was the bhakra and angal in uh, punjab that was the name pandit nehru called it first modern temple of india and third he started developing the iit system the first iit came in iit kharagpur and so on so that is what pandit nehru started doing it now let me tell you uh, two more things uh, the uh, 1947 as i said uh, only 1360 megawatt we were the poor country at that time that is why third world country what is third world third world is three types one is the fast developing developing and under developed as far as energy is concerned we are not even fast developing we are only developing the reason is uh, uh, there is uh, we have to get we have to become a developed country and how will become developed country we are already developed in five respects we are the uh, second largest technological and scientific main power in the world wherever i have gone 39 countries i found keralites there and doing very well so i am very happy to see that all appam also they used to give me appam and milk and of course those sightly everything and uh, there there's a program program is let's go that is malayalam malayalam is a very rich language and uh, i can understand some of it not full of it but i'm trying to learn it more more of it uh, because i have been to in kerala so many places i have been to mala i have been to Tr trichur uh, dr chitra is the pr principal there then uh, the nit uh, calicut director is a good friend of mine then of course palkad uh, that is iit palkad then the trivandrum old uh, engineering government engineering college i have been there also then there is a kotayam i have been there then there is a central university kochi i have been there also i have been practically everywhere in kerala such a wonderful state so third world as i told you 
fast developing developing and under develop next slide please yes you can see these are the main problems why we are not at develop problem number one population growth uh, population is growing exponentially my request to all of you is to have hum do hamara ek kindly have only one child and if it is a girl child you should celebrate more because girls serve the parents till the end boys only serve till they get their wives so try to get only one uh, child whether it is a girl child or a boy child it doesn't matter parvai le parvai le do parvai la like that you know that is don't worry about it load load is also growing exponentially the time we get up in the morning uh, you know then we need we prepare breakfast we prepare uh, idli dosa chutney all these things need uh, electricity then juicer all these juicer also needs electricity uh, then we have the uh, what you call um, tea maker coffee maker coffee is very popular in, uh, in south india so is the tea in the north india whether you make tea or coffee you need electricity then we are adding one australia four new zealand every year in our uh, population we are going to overtake china in few years i think that is bad news we should not overtake china we should overtake china in good things like manufacturing like education like electricity like energy and uh, we should be overtaken then the defense uh, in china i have been three times three wonderful things are there there you know uh, most of the chinese uh, use cycle cycle means they are saving their petrol and diesel so we should also uh, you know view cycles for going one place to another so that we can save petrol and diesel second thing our breakfast should be a uh, working breakfast not a uh, uh, sleeping breakfast just have one dosa one idli one vada and one coffee that is enough don't take two three dosas four five idlis no don't take a uh, sleeping breakfast take only working breakfast so that we are okay third thing is china uh, the work uh, working hours are 8 am to 8 pm whereas our working hours are 8 am to uh, 4 pm or 5 pm so our working hours should also be as good as china so that we can become a developed country soon the third thing is stable government luckily kerala has a very stable government even uh, the country at the moment is having stable government so we can plan energy and environment resources Uh, we are having so many nri and best nris are keralites they are everywhere in the world so they can send money to the kerala and make kerala a developed state more developed it's already developed more developed if kerala develops means whole country gets developed that is the beauty so resources we have to earn we have to we request our nri keralites to come to kerala and uh, start uh, energy you know uh, power stations whether it is a solar whether it is a wind whether it is hydro so all these power stations will help the kerala to develop further help the india to develop further yes now as i told you uh, the per capita energy consumption india is 1200 kilowatt hour qatar where so many kerlaites are there is 15000 kilowatt hour the best in the world is uh, norway and sweden of course china is 4000 we are only 1200 so we should overtake china in terms of uh, per capita energy consumption so that we become a developed country usa is 12000 uh, pakistan is lower than india bangladesh is lower than india i have been to pakistan i have been to bangladesh bangladesh you can have mou with uh, independent university and buet buet is bangladesh university of engineering and technology is a wonderful university you can have a uh, you know mou with them so that we can uh, we can use the bangladesh and bangladesh can use our country so that we can progress each other in fact bangladesh was uh, created thanks to the uh, late prime minister indira gandhi we used to call her uh, iron lady you know she was the person responsible for creation of bangladesh and bangladesh has just just completed golden jubilee and then uh, our prime minister honorable uh, modi ji went there so this is important thing about the uh, ne ne next slide please
so installed capacity at the moment we are 3.71 gigawatt and we we want to make it 5 gigawatt to become a developed country energy management is very important there is a uh, university of energy management in kochi so there uh, my uh, request to all of you is after doing btech in electrical please do mba in energy management so that we can make our country independent as far as energy is concerned so uh, you can call me anywhere wherever you want i can come let the corona go away then i can come and just and uh, deliver lecture in uh, whichever city you want let it kochi let it be kotayam let it be uh, what you call mala let it be trichur kalikat kannur whichever uh, city you want including iit palkad including nit uh, kalikat all these places i am willing to come and uh, share my knowledge i have written five energy books kindly read all of them one is a uh, uh, what you call wind energy book along with uma shankar uma shankar currently is in saudi arabia he was my phd student similarly jay prakash was my phd student he is in kannur he is a professor in government engineering college kannur i keep going to kannur whenever they invite me and I deliver a lecture similarly i go to any any place in kannur in kerala wherever they invite me now let me tell you these are this is a very important slide these are the means to achieve how do we achieve good energy management how do we achieve uh, advanced country first is kindly give the uh, energy in the evening time so that in the day time we can distribute that energy to some and my request to all of you those who are uh, engineering colleges there uh, to have evening evening like uh, courses also like iit delhi we have a evening mtech energy we have a evening mba similarly you can have an evening so that those who work in the day time they can come in the evening and work and get a degree so that is the importance of evening similarly give the uh, give the power to industry in the evening time so that in day time you can save the power different time zones i hope those who of you or friends are in usa you know that there are six time zones there is the uh, honolulu hawaii different and your los angeles san francisco different chicago different new york and uh, boston different so these are different time zones like your australia you have different time zones that's why when a cricket match is played you get uh, your, your what you call commentary at different time even in india when it was undivided india you know the pakistan is half an hour behind and bangladesh is half an hour ahead so why not divide india into three parts let western india can have pakistan timing and eastern india can have bangladesh timing so the whole country can be divided into three parts so that we can have uh, different time zones and we can save energy secondly oh where is the second point you have changed it ah zebnet letter daylight saving so all of you know who those who are friends in usa uh, you know that the uh, the time time the difference is there uh, the honolulu time is different san francisco uh, los angeles time different chicago time different and uh, your new york and boston times are different so when you have to ring your friends in <coughs> in usa you ring at different time similarly as i told you about the third thing the staggering of office timing some offices start at 6 some at 7 some at 8 so you can prepare your breakfast at different time so that is the advantage of staggering of office timing you can save your money you can you can be in the see in kochi you have the metro train so you can sit in the kochi at different time so that is the advantage of uh, staggering of office timings yes please next please so as i told you the india the power generation is three types one is thermal hydro nuclear all three are bad why they are bad thermal is bad because when you burn the coal ash is formed and the ash doesn't mean ashura rai this ash means rock rock is hindi word similarly in malayalam you can find out what is ash so don't throw the ash in ganga ja yamuna or river just 
throw the ash in the gaddas the digs in the road so that your road becomes very smooth that is the beauty of ash ash you can prepare uh, uh, brick it also the fuel and you can burn in improved chula so that your kerlite ladies don't spoil their eye eyesight next thing what you can do is your uh, uh, when you burn the coal you get nox uh, so2 and socks all these called greenhouse gases these gases are harmful for the human beings as well as for the buildings so what do you do and that's why in electrical engineering now four topics are very important emission dispatch how to minimize this gases so that uh, we can have uh, less pollution and the sea level doesn't go up the sea level goes up tomorrow there may not be chennai there may not be mumbai there may not be sri lanka we don't want that to happen we don't we want all these cities all these countries be there so that we can progress so that is why the uh, greenhouse gases should be minimized similarly economic dispatch the coal should be uh, reduced in such a way that our fuel cost is minimum third thing which we want is electric vehicles now future is electric cars not a uh, petrol car or diesel car the best electric car today is a hyundai 25 lakh then the riva car was there in bangalore and another uh, so many electric vehicles are there electric scooter electric cycle electric car so that we can save petrol and diesel next thing we can use is uh, power quality i think myself and jay prakash my student in kannur we have written a book on power quality so power quality is very important hvdc similarly uh, kerala has thorium 420 100000 tons of thorium thorium can be used to generate nuclear power by using uh, fast builder reactor that's why kerala has a lot of nuclear power <coughs> so this is the what you call the uh, your uh, installed capacities there now hydro hydro is there lot of hydro is there in kerala we have a uh, five types of hydro we have the nano hydro pico hydro micro hydro mini hydro small hydro all these uh, hydro will not have any gestation period more than a year the highest hydro power plant in india is terry where i am chairman board of governor 13000 megawatt kerala is full of hydro power nuclear nuclear is good provided we don't have the radioactivity so that we have to minimize so that our human beings are safe our buildings are safe and uh, first first nuclear power came in tarapur 1969 thanks to the dr bhava and dr pandit nehru Mandi Nehru died on 27 May 1964. Baba died in a air accident, but the plant came. And second, second plant came to uh, Kota, which is the Kochi capital of India. Tired. I lost. Hello. Uh, thank you professor uh, for the uh, enlightening session uh, <clears throat> yasin yes am i audible yeah yes uh, you can take over the session we so next we invite dr babak and sorry department of mechanical engineering and integrated nano systems development institute prude school of engineering and technology indiana university prude university indianapolis usa dr babak and sorry received his phd at drexel university in 2014 in the materials science and engineering department the birthplace of 
magazines before joining the Prude School of Engineering and Technology. He was a research assistant professor at the AJ. Dr. Ansori, Ansori's current research focuses on the synthesis and characterizations of novel enzymes and their metal and ceramic composites. He is one of the top five trending authors in the field of material science and nanotechnology in the world. And among the global highly cited researchers, 2019 and 2020, recognized by the Web of Science, Dr. Ansori has received several national and international awards and recognitions for his research and artistic way of presenting science, including NSF Science Virtualization Challenge in 2011 and 2013. Diamond ranking of ASUS graduate excellence in the material science in 2012, Materials Research Society postdoctoral award in 2016, and emerging leaders of 2020 by Journal of Physics Considered Matter. He is currently one of the chair of the early career professionals subcommittee of the Materials Research Society. Sir, um, now I request you to address the gathering. Thank you for the introduction. Before I start, I just want to make sure that, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, your, sir. Screen is your screen is visible. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction and thanks for the organizing committee for putting this uh, very exciting conference together and specifically Dr. Rajesh CR for inviting me uh, to this um, conference. Today I'm going to talk about the uh, large family of uh, two di two dimensional materials that called maxines. And um, before I start, uh, we all know that uh, the pandemic has has brought a lot of cha challenges to the world. But at least one thing that we realize is that uh, the, the distance is is no longer an issue. Right now, I am located in state of Indiana in the U.S and in the city of Indianapolis and uh, my time is 12 30 a.m. so um, after I, I give this talk you will continue and and uh, you have your work day and then I, I I will go to bed because it is after midnight so before I start I just want to give you a little bit of background about my university and where I'm located right now so as I said I'm in Indiana which is in Midwest this this region of the US is called Midwest and uh, the city of Indianapolis, this, these are a few pictures that um, if uh, you are into sport cars, uh, every, every year uh, there are a lot of uh, competition and one of them is Indy 500, which is uh, every year in Indianapolis and hopefully this year will continue. And um, so about the university, the university is the, in the city of Indianapolis and it is called Indiana University Purdue University and we are uh, we have uh, uh, degrees uh, bachelor's master's and PhD and they're all from Purdue University my department is mechanical and energy engineering which is a very unique combination we, we do we give degrees in mechanical engineering as well as in energy engineering. So you can have your bachelor as an engineering in energy. And we welcome students from many universities in India to uh, ha come for a semester of, of visit for a non-degree student uh, to just to come and explore the environment and uh, be a visiting student. And we, have, we offer uh, several generous scholarship as well. And we also have a lot of international students in our university. We have a lot of uh, Indian students um, that uh, they do undergraduate, they get bachelor's, they do master's and PhD students that we have in our department and in our university. Now, the technical part of this, uh, this talk. So one of the track of this conference is material science. But the question is, why even do we care about novel materials? Well, the, the very reason that right now we are making this conference virtually online and I'm far away from where you are and we are still communicating is 
because of novel nanomaterials. Without nanomaterials, we could not have all these technologies. In all of our cell phones, computers, we have billions of transistors. They're all made of nanomaterials. Now, moving forward for another 10 years of technology advancement, we need novel materials that maybe even we haven't thought about yet to get to that advancement. And this is the focus of this talk. One of the novel materials that the past 15 years uh, was the focus of many scientists was called two-dimensional materials. It started with the two-dimensional carbon, which is called graphene, in 2004. And um, the research exploded in the past 16, 17 years. Now, we have a series of different family of two-dimensional materials, such as hexagonal boron nitride, transition metal dicalcogenides, and many more. And one of them is transition metal carmide called maxines, which is the focus of my talk today. So what are maxines? Well, we call them maxines because of the M and X. M is a metal. It is a uh, a, a, an early transition metal, such as titanium, vanadium, niobium, on the left-hand side of the periodic table in the transition metal region. And X is either carbon or nitrogen. We can have four different types of maxines. In each of these, if you look carefully, we have two layers of a transition metal that is covering a layer of X, which is carbon and nitrogen. So imagine we have a layer of carbon and then we have a layer of uh, a metal above and the bottom. So these are all spheres representing atoms. We are looking at the schematic of atoms. So we're talking about a material that it is only five atomic layer thick. Now, because uh, we can have um, three, two layers of carbon and three layers of, of transition metal and, and increase that. Because we have transition metal on the surface, always the surface of these maxines, they have surface termination. By that, I mean because we have metal, metal without having the full bonding, so it doesn't satisfy all the valence electron, so it will bond to whatever is available in the environment. Oxygen is one of them, so oxygen is one of the surface termination, the yellow atoms that we are showing here. It can be also hydroxyl because humidity is everywhere. So you can have OH group on the surface or it can be fluorine and chlorine. Maxine started in 2011 and in 10 years we went from no composition ever made to more than 30 different composition made for Maxine's and with a lot more possibility that we are exploring. Now, um, the first thing you might ask is how do we make these nanomaterials? So the synthesis of maxine starts from a precursor. By that I mean imagine you have carbide powder. Carbide powders are usually grayish black color and we have a type of a ternary carbide that is called max phases and we have uh, these in different forms of two, three, four, or five layers of transition metal. And then we can selectively exfoliate these and to make them very thin to become a 2D material. How do we make a max phase? So first we need to make the precursor. To make this precursor for maxines, the first thing we do is to mix the elemental powder. For example, if you're going to make a titanium containing maxine, First, we need to make a titanium aluminum. So aluminum is more of a sacrificial. We are going to add it to make it layer structure. Then later on, we are going to remove it. That I will explain it in, in a minute. So we are going to add, for example, three moles of titanium, one mole roughly of aluminum, two moles of carbon. We mix these together. Then we put it in a control environment. By that I mean, for example, a tube furnace or a vacuum furnace and heat it up to certain temperature. For example, for this certain composition, it is 1400 degrees Celsius. 
for two hours hold it for two hours and then we cool it down by just ramping it up to a certain temperature the, everything will react and it will form a layered structure so this is all done by thermodynamics so we just heat it up it will react all these elements will react and form the desired phase there are more than 100 different of these layered structure in all of these if you look carefully we have this maxine layer that they're all bonded with a layer of aluminum for example or other a group elements the a group elements can be aluminum silicon germanium gallium and others so we have this layered structure now by putting these into a very um, selective etching acid for example hydrofluoric acid it will hydrofluoric acid will selectively attack aluminum layers these red layers and remove those dissolve those in in the acid and what we remain with is these transition metal and carbon layers by doing that then they will get surface termination <clears throat> because i just explained the metals will bond to whatever is available in the environment and then we can turn from something which is bulk and gray black to something that has the same color but now it has open structure so we are opening the structure ready to for full delamination to turn into single flakes so by just mechanical agitation such as manual shaking so for example if you have this solution if we put it in a shaker or even shake it manually we can separate these flakes of transition metals to individual two-dimensional flakes that they're only one nanometer thick and they have a lateral size of few hundred nanometers to few microns now we're talking about novel advanced manufacturing so we have the nanomaterial but if we cannot make it in large quantity it will not really help the advancement of technology and uh, so we need something that we can scale it up for maxines the one of the major advantage of this 2d materials is that it is scalable we can make it in in the lab obviously we do it in a small scale but see even in the lab size we can make very long films of maxines we can have the ink and we can spray it we can deposit it to make a film a flexible film we can have ink with different solvent it can be a water base or it can be organic base so you can think about printing we can use 3d printing to print nanomaterials that they can be used for a variety of applications that will explain what are the applications in a second as i said we can control the lateral size what we are seeing here is a two-dimensional flake on an aluminum membrane so it's aluminum filter that we put a flake of a 2d maxine we see that the flake size can be a few microns or we can break it down by sonication by ultra sonication we can break it down to less than one micron so we can control the size what are the properties you might ask well maxine properties they have high metallic conductivity so uh, many other 2d materials such as transition metal dicalcogenides they are semiconductors or we have oxides they are insulators or semiconductors for maxines they have high metallic conductivity and they also uh, are transparent they only absorb three percent of visible light per one nanometer which is slightly lower even than graphene in terms of thickness uh, they can transport ions so they can be used in energy storage devices and they can absorb different molecules they have hydrophilicity and they are stable in solution because of their negative zeta potential what are the applications because of these features and many of the papers and studies on maxine have been on energy storage catalysis we need sources of energy we need for example hydrogen production we need reducing carbon dioxide so we have we need to remove co2 all of that can be done by the catalysis 
properties of Maxine. Electromagnetic, I will explain in a minute, and others. Now, one thing I want to emphasize, and this paper, we explain it very well in that publishing advanced materials in this year, is that all of these applications, it all relies on nanomaterial. Also, understanding the mechanical properties, more related to many of you here, is critical for all of these applications. So, um, we see that we basically show importance and many of them are green, meaning that mechanical properties is essential for all of these applications. Now, speaking of application, I'm going to show you a quick few examples. For example, for electromagnetic, I, I set an alarm to make sure that I don't go over time. So um, if I, um, I think I, I have uh, four more minutes, so I will keep it to, to that. And if I'm going over time, please let me know uh, from the organizers that I can stop. So one of the applications I mentioned is in electronics for electromagnetic waves interaction. So all of our cell phones that we, are, we have, our, all of our electronics, we have a lot of uh, devices and pieces inside that they can interfere with each other. And we have a lot of coding that can protect them. We have shown that Maxine can be the thinnest ever nanomaterial or any type of material can, that can outperform and we can use for blocking these noises from one part to another. And they can be better even than metals like aluminum or copper that they uh, are the highest and the outperforming of, of others. The other application, I mentioned we have Maxine ink. So just imagine you have a conductive paint that you can spray and have your antenna. Instead of, for example, etching and making a copper antenna, we can simply make antenna just by spraying. And we have shown that Maxine has the best antenna performance among all materials, not only nanomaterials, it is at the level of metals which is significant for something that you just make and spray like an ink. The other, uh, related to mechanical properties, Maxine's, the two-dimensional carbides have the highest mechanical properties among all the nanomaterials that can be synthesized by solution processing. I have to emphasize that many of us know that, for example, graphene has the highest elastic modulus with 1,000 uh, gigapascal or 1 terapascal. But that is for a single flake of graphene when we exfoliate it by mechanical exfoliation. So that method is not scalable and we cannot use it for manufacturing. We need to use graphene oxide, which drops from 1,000 to 200 gigapascal. Maxine, when we do the solution processing that I just explained how, we get the highest elastic modules, which is very important for several applications. What applications? For example, composite. For composite, if you want to put uh, Maxines in metal or ceramic composite, they have to be stable at high temperature. And we have shown that they are high temperature stable. So we can put these two dimensional materials that we can put it for batteries. At the same time, we can put it in metals or ceramics for future manufacturing for stronger metal parts or even ceramic parts. For example, for a space shuttle, all of the space exploration that we have ahead of us, we want to go to different places, moon, Mars, all of that. We want to have reusable uh, space shuttles. For re-entry cones, we need to have something sustainable and the Maxine can be used for those to improve the properties, improve the fracture toughness of these ultra-high temperature materials. Now, I just mostly talk about one type of Maxine, and I mentioned that there are a variety of different compositions. And because of the time, I will not, I will just min briefly mention the possibility. So I was just focusing on one type of Maxine, which is titanium 3C2. 
but we can see that there is a lot of possibilities and all of the ones that they are not shown with solid it means that they have not been synthesized yet so we do have a lot of possibilities now we can also do something unique which is when we use two different transition metals which we call them double transition metals we can have a salt solution meaning that we can have a mixture of different elements two elements and Maxine has a unique feature where we can get two different layers of metal so we can just think of it. one atom layer is molybdenum another atom layer is titanium why that's important because simply by combining this we can tune we can improve the mechanical properties for example if one type like titanium 3c2 has here's the the mechanical properties of the strengths now if you go with molybdenum or tungsten just by replacing the outer atomic layers we can significantly almost double that value so we can tune the mechanical properties beyond mechanical we can also tune the optical properties by combining two different elements or even electrical properties so we, it gives a lot of tunability now in 2021 just this basically in april we put the first high entropy maxine paper in high entropies again that i will not talk about and this is the the last slide of, of my technical it is where we have four different elements where it can improve certain properties like catalysis mechanical properties it can be even enhanced this this material is so new that we have no information about any of these properties yet because we just reported it in april and the paper is under review but it is available on archive so you can if you just google high entropy 2d maxines you will find the paper and learn more about it so the possibilities is endless and i invite everyone if you are interested in material science to get involved and start thinking the possibilities start exploring this novel materials for the future advancement of manufacturing and technology before i finish my talk i also want to promote a competition that we have every year which is called the nano orthography if you have any scientific image it can be even optical or it can be even with the camera show a scientific concept and then you can submit it to nano orthography and you can win up to one thousand dollars and it is open to everyone so you can submit it by september 30th and win one thousand dollars so feel free to go to this website nano orthography and win cash prizes and with that i would like to thank again for uh, for your attention and happy to answer any question thank you sir um are there any queries uh, hello sir uh, can you comment on the 3d printability of these magazines sure yes so um if it, you I, I stopped the sharing the screen so uh, i should we have maxine ink right and that uh, maxine ink we can control the concentration so uh, it can be for example one gra gram per uh, liter of water which is not 3d printer it's just more of an ink more of a paint but we can increase that to having about 60 or 30 gram per liter or we say 30 milligrams per milliliters and that is a solution that becomes like a paste and that there are papers already published that show that you can easily use that and 3d print different patterns for example it can be used for micro supercapacitors for small energy storage devices or potentially we can combine maxine with polymers which already is done or even use maxine for 3d printing metals and ceramics by at the same time improving their properties such as conductivity electrical conductivity mechanical properties and all of that okay thank, thank you so sure you're welcome thank you sir thank you for your informative speech Thank next you so week, much. Next, we okay. invite Dr. Mikhail 
boroscope uh, dragon cope department uh, uh. sir am i audible yes you are audible next we invite dr mikhail dragon cope who is going to give a keynote lecture on tensile and compressive spring stiffness under various loading is also a department of theoretical and applied mechanics peter n san petersburg polytechnic university st petersburg russia with the time of progress does not stand still the production of tensile compression springs become available to a wide range of makers due to profilation of 3d printing technologies depending on the needs of manufacturer and the road material can vary the spring can have different configuration and coil from the variety of bar shapes it can be necessary to consider different load conditions at the ends of the spring so the stage is all yours so hi everyone i think uh, um so uh is my presentation visible so uh, yes sir it's visible yes it is visible ah thank you so uh then we start uh okay my name is uh mikhail babinkov i'm from st petersburg and this work uh, uh we uh have done together with my worker daria bolkhosova so it is about uh the coiled springs and their stiffnesses so we are planning to uh reevaluate to a revisit uh known formulas provided by uh textbooks so and see whether they are applicable to uh the modern uh modern approximations to in in contemporary designs and to switch to the next slide yes i'm from st petersburg so you can uh you can see this uh, tiny dots on the map, so it's far, far away, uh, and uh, we have uh, like 8 a.m. in the morning, so it's not that early here. So let's move uh, towards the main topic of the presentation. I'll try to be short. So, uh, we are living in 3D printing era when everyone can print uh, whatever he, he or she wants to, actually. So, and there are lots of, uh, there are great variety of different uh, pencil elements that can be stretched and uh, can serve as the springs for uh, your design, for your work. Uh, they have a particular application in medicine. Uh, for example, uh, it is very convenient if you have uh, 3D printing machine so you can uh, model uh, the spring of your own design and instantly print it but a uh, very famous formula that uh, gives you the estimation of its stiffness sometimes can fail uh, mostly because it lacks uh, lots of uh, mechanical constants. Of course, uh, there are a variety of different formulas in 
different textbooks, but uh, let's be honest. All the springs that were made up to the time are standard springs. So if you do have imagination, probably uh, you will somehow print, somehow create something uh, more uh, more complicated than just the standard coiled spring. So uh, together with my co-worker, we're trying to estimate the stiffness of what we will have in the end. Uh, first of all, it is interesting to uh, not just to obtain the formula, but uh, to measure uh, to measure the real stiffness of a spring and to compare our uh, calculations with uh, the results of the measurements, with the results of the experiment. These are examples of how actually uh, we can measure the stiffness. So the very first and simple method is just to uh, press the spring, press on the spring to register uh, the pressure uh, and elongation that and deformation of the spring, and then recalculate the stiffness. Uh, another less obvious method uh, allowing us to evaluate the spring stiffness is dynamical methods. Uh, we can turn, uh, we can attach the spring to uh, the vibro stand and find its first uh, Eigen frequency, which allows us to uh, calculate uh, its stiffness knowing the mass of an object. So, in our work, uh, we produce all the types of the uh, experiment. So, here we have uh, some examples of 3D printed coils. So they, they can be tested on the uh, tensile stress, tensile stretching, and rotation. So also, we do numerical check. Uh, so let's get closer to the nodal itself. So uh, if uh, we elongate uh, the coiled spring along its axis of symmetry by a force applied parallel to its axis of symmetry, we're going, we're going to have just slightly longer spring in, in the end, but we need to specify a uh, boundary conditions, actually. We need to think about boundary conditions at uh, the both ends of the rod, which makes our spring, which makes our coils, actually. So we need to think about it uh, because in different applications, we're going to have different boundary conditions. So in this uh, simplistic example, uh, we use uh, standard boundary conditions when rotations are prohibited at the both ends of the spring. So, as we can see, the spring elongates almostly, almost evenly. using the rod C 
theory, one can easily calculate uh, the more precise formula just by giving just by giving uh, the geometry of the curved rod and knowing its uh, Young's modulus and shear modulus of the material it is made of. So uh, we can clearly see that uh, rod theory provides more precise results regarding also the spring step, which lacks in the standard formula, and and also it gives us uh, dependence on the Young's modulus. It is very important because uh, in a standard uh, coil spring, it is supposed that uh, the rod only rotates around its axis. But in real life, for real materials, it, it can be uh, not an option, actually. So uh, the handmade spring can, uh, can demonstrate uh, a very different behavior. So, and this formula is capable of uh, producing precise results in such a case. So uh, we have uh, two, two possibilities. When you stretch the spring, uh, the rod uh, just rotates around its axis. So it's, um, and another possibility uh, the rod bends. So we have two types of stiffnesses, the bending stiffness and a rotational stiffness of the rod, which results into uh, the overall formula giving us uh, the, st um, the stiffness of the spring. Let's go further to the different boundary conditions. So uh, we can fix on the one end uh, the bottom end, and we can let uh, the upper end uh, to rotate on its own. But uh, still we apply the force parallel to its axis. So it is straight up forward. In this case, uh, we obtain different results. In the simplistic approximation of uh, the formula uh, given at the first slide, here it is. We can see that uh, here the result is quite different. So instead of uh, 8 in the enumerator, we have 12. So this spring is less stiff than the previous one. And actually, uh, this is quite tricky to know because uh, the textbooks and uh, handbooks provide uh, a single formula. And if you don't uh, actually don't know what boundary conditions are applied in order to obtain it, uh, the, the probability of the mistake rises. So, I believe uh, this is all uh, of what I was going to 
say, uh, the Roth theory allows uh, various um, calculations. So you can evaluate, for example, the stiffness and the final geometry of any spring of your desire. So probably uh, such element uh, can be called just that simple springs because they are far beyond uh, far beyond standard uh, standard approximation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, are there any queries? Thank you for your informative speech, sir. Thank you once again. Next, we invite Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Raut, who is going to give a keynote lecture on role of material research for social development. He's also a professor at the Department of Physics, BIT, Marissa Ranchi, from February 4, 2020 to till date. Associate professor at the Department of Physics, BIT, Marissa Ranchi, B, from June 28, 2012 to February 3rd, 2020. He's also an assistant professor at the Department of Physics, BIT, Marissa Ranchi, from November 2006 to 2012. So I request you to address the gathering. Please. Hello, oh, our resource person will, we will join in two minutes. Okay, sir. Sanjeev, sir, uh, the stage is all set. Good morning, everyone. This is Professor Raoult. Good morning, good, sir. Good, good morning, sir. Very good morning, sir. We have given a brief introduction. Uh, and you can deliver the session now, sir. OK, uh, should I start? Yes, sir, you can start the presentation. OK, OK. Yes, my, uh, is my presentation visible? Yes, sir, it's loading. Okay. At the outset, I thank the organizer for giving me a chance to speak before you uh, about uh, uh, the role of material research for social development. Uh, the, my talk I have deliberately made uh, very basic. I have not uh, included any research content in this uh, presentation, uh, uh, keeping in mind that there will be many students who will be listening to this. So uh, uh, coming to the presentation, uh, I'll be, uh, my talk will be uh, briefly, uh, I'll be discussing about this introduction and importance of this material science in the today's 
and this very old term that we know this is a classical solid state the people to this uh, change in what one factor physics uh, i'll give, give a brief uh, glimpse about our research uh, outcome about this dielectric ferroelectric and their application for the social development particularly for uh, energy harvesting and uh, solid oxide fuel cell energy material kind of things so in this way i'll conclude so to start with, uh, I'll show you these two pictures. So uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, all the audience must have seen these two pictures. Uh, uh, the first picture shows, uh, everybody know what the first picture is. The first picture is the uh, picture of the Titanic, the ship, the Titanic. The Titanic, uh, uh, coming to this uh, role of the material research, I'll start with this uh, uh, movie. Sanjeev, uh, sir. Uh, yes. Sir, your presentation hasn't been loaded. It's not been loaded? Uh, we can see the, uh, not the slideshow. We cannot see the slideshow? Right. Okay, I'll start again. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Now you can see the slides? Yes, yes. Now I can change it? Yes, sir. OK. Yes. Uh, as I was studying, so these two uh, pictures, the first picture is uh, everybody seen the movie, The Titanic. The second one is the uh, famous astronaut, this is Kalpana Chawala, everybody know. So, uh, the starting with this uh, role of material research, I'll start with this movie, uh, say in the Titanic. Uh, as everybody knows that the ship maker of the Titanic, at that time he was claiming that uh, a uh, needle or pin may sink in the water, but the Titanic will never sink. But uh, you know what happens to the fate of this Titanic, even it cannot complete its first journey. So, uh, why it happened so? It is not that the uh, quality of the steel used in that titanic ship was a poor quality or there was any engineering failure so at that time it was not the case so it has good quality steel are used and properly engineered it's a very big ship uh, the claim was proper but uh, the thing is that it is not it also not that the manufacturer was not aware that there will be a iceberg when it will be coming from in moving in a sea everything was known to him Definitely, there'll be a spot, but there'll be a, uh, like mountain-like things may uh, may come in the uh, way, so which may uh, may the ship may collide with that. So these things was also known to him. So its uh, property was studied. So he had made this and claimed that a needle may sink, but Titanic will not sink. But what happened? So why it happened? So uh, at sub-zero temperature, at sub-zero temperature, the material property remains get changed so that it become brittle. Or, uh, so at that time when it collided with the iceberg, it break. So coming to the second picture, I will show that uh, this, uh, this second picture is shown with the Kalpana Chawla. He had the uh, she had completed his first journey to the space, and the second journey uh, she could not complete. So why it happened? So the cause of accident was due to uh, a hole in one of the shuttle's wing when it when it was moving up, uh, taking up. During launch, uh, uh, insulation had broken off and damaged the thermal protection of the system of the shuttle wing. As the shuttle passed through the atmosphere when it is coming down, when it is passed through the atmosphere, hot gas stream into the wing, making the sensors failure. The space, uh, space, uh, spaceship depressurized, killing the uh, crew in less than a minute. So why it happened? So it's not that uh, uh, it was not known. <coughs> so at that time, the insulation material was used it may there is a engineering failure so uh, at that time it uh, uh, it's this kind of effect happened so it's a, uh, very uh, sad demise of this all six crew member uh, was dead so uh, that means i want to say this all this development starting from this titanic uh, and this uh, uh, now the space dip, modern uh, space shuttles are uh, developed depending upon the requirement it is not that this requirement came in this era this this requirement was in the uh, earlier also so basically uh, I'm, I'm showing this is the uh, basically uh, how 
this uh, historical development uh, of material takes place as per the requirement as you know earlier the first age was the uh, stone age at the time stone wood clay skins were being used uh, for the uh, 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 living purpose of the human beings at the time they were using a material which will be harder than this uh, uh, clay so that they can harder than uh, basically they want a hard material to fulfill their uh, daily requirement so that is at the time the people are using the stones the age was known as stone age then they need another uh, when they want to give a proper shape to stone they need some more uh, some harder material than the stone they go for uh, copper or bronze which are those are harder than this so they have used is in the bronze age so they have uh, made this all household equipment all the weapons all these things have they could try to make it out of bronze then they need still harder material they uh, they go for this uh, uh, iron then in place of uh, copper they try to choose iron uh, so they that uh, iron they can put in the uh, uh, this uh, uh, fire and they can give a proper shape then uh, they can use it for their uh, daily requirement living so uh, in that is that uh, gradually this uh, stone age bronze age iron age came so in that case uh, gradual development of material science came so in the modern age so they try to uh, they need uh, uh, now also need that we harder material than that of iron so then they put some nickel the carbon they try to make some harder material than that of iron which is basically steel sometimes not only harder material is required sometimes the lightweight material is also required so at that time they go for the composites composite you know what's composite for the steel everybody know so i'm not going to discuss about the steel composite now everybody is running behind the nano materials so <clears throat> now gradually as the requirement comes into picture the pe people try to develop the material uh, starting from the stone copper iron the steel age composite the nano material this is the modern age now we can classify all this material for the students i am giving a few slides i'll be telling uh, for the students so that is for the for uh, common classification of the materials we can classify this materials as metal and uh, this uh, uh, polymer ceramics composite nano crystalline material again this uh, non linear material bio materials again they have the different sub classes of met uh, metals are could be your ferrous and uh, non ferrous some are magnetic non magnetic again this polymer are of two types this thermoplastic thermosetting so uh, they have their this examples have shown you here now ceramic uh, then composites uh, uh, nano crystalline and uh, non linear material and bio materials are also uh, being used so coming to the ceramic i will give to tell you one story about the ceramics so <clears throat> when i you know when we were kids at the time the people uh, kids were used to uh, play with clays so using this clay uh, kid used to make uh, uh, elephant uh, they make a horse they make different different shape uh, 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 animals or something, some what, anything they like using this clay. When these two kids were playing with these clays, they are not at all doing their uh, posting time. When their grandmother, grandmother came, and uh, at the time this uh, uh, she was uh, using this uh, wood to uh, uh, make the uh, daily uh, cooking. So at the time, uh, uh, what she did. people this uh, children who are making this horse and elephants everything the uh, the uh, anything any type of shape and uh, she put uh, took all this uh, uh, clay uh, the soft clay uh, structured uh, like this horse and elephant and she put it in the fire and the, 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 we will throw this and as these things are there you are playing all this day and you are not doing any other things so we are doing any other job you are not doing you are just uh, wasting your time and uh, just playing with all these only clays so what she did he took all these uh, uh, this uh, uh, toys the people sub kids have made that tall elephant or horse whatever it is they made they put in the uh, their fire the next day when he clean when she clean this uh, uh, this <coughs> this fire she found that this uh, uh, this uh, toys become very strong and uh, hard it become more easy to uh, be for the uh, kids to play so it is not at that time it is not uh, uh, deformed by the minimum uh, force 
so it become a very strong so it become easy for them to stop the kids are become very happy so from that uh, the material development came into picture ceramic role of ceramic came into picture the uh, people uh, try to take some uh, this clay and put it in the high temperature and the fire it they center it the calcine or whatever it may be that people name it they give a proper shape and put in the high temperature to make a permanent structure so now this this tiles and this basin spans are all are structural ceramics uh, earlier they are being used nowadays uh, by the development of this ceramics uh, modern ceramics those are called your uh, traditional ceramics or classical ceramics now this this modern ceramics are developed now ceramics has almost uh, 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 replaced all these metals in our day to day lives and uh, even uh, any uh, even the you know what the size of the computer earlier the size that size of this bulky fans were earlier the capacitors the bulky capacitors are used earlier because of the development of modern ceramics this uh, uh, bulky structure has has been reduced to a, a very small and uh, uh, a very beautiful structures so <clears throat> now i uh, will give you few examples of modern ceramics towards the end of this uh, uh, talk now uh, now coming to the engineering material engineering materials we can say there could be two type one could be your monolithic material other could be a hybrid material so this monolithic material this are uh, metal or metallic alloys so the ceramics and ceramic alloy and glasses these are and polymers or elastomers and they are known as your monolithic material that single phase material could be there in case of the hybrid there could be two phase uh, uh, material could be possible there in high in composite i can say this in a, a monolithic or uh, alloy this 1 plus 1 will be 2 but in case of hybrid or composite kind of material this 1 plus 1 is basically 11 the 2 plus 2 2 materials will remain there uh, to identically uh, two different phases will be uh, present there but effective property effective uh, property of the two different material will be increased by many fold so it's uh, like in 11 the two ones are there but the uh, it is not two nor it is one it is basically 11 so <coughs> similarly uh, uh, we can class this as composites are uh, there be uh, uh, two or more solid components usually in matrix other is called your reinforcement uh, if people know better the sandwich structure the composite could be of different type uh, it could be sandwich structure material uh, on the surface and uh, material on the core will be different or lattice structure uh, typically this combination of material and space uh, the uh, lattice structure as uh, there the segments are there uh, segment structure are divided in one dimensional two dimensional three dimensional also they may consist of one or uh, two materials uh, in this so based on the morphology and the reinforcement uh, the particle reinforced uh, when it is pulling the particle reinforced you can say zero di zero dimensional and when we are reinforcing with a fiber we say say one dimensional or once we are going for the laminate we can say the two dimensional structure in the side so uh, coming to uh, this uh, property why uh, why we need this kind of uh, different type of material why we and uh, uh, different types of material what the different combination different orientation why all this need need these are basically uh, uh, want to understand what determines the properties of the material the property of material are basically uh, determined by two important characteristic those are called your atomic structure or it is called your electromagnetic structure the so atomic structure uh, uh, am i audible can you hear me yes yes okay. so uh, this uh, atomic structure and uh, electromagnetic structure this uh, uh, atomic structure i will show you how this uh, uh, atomic structure in addition to that at atomic and electromagnetic structure there are some other structures we are uh, keen on this they are called your uh, microstructure uh, they are basically microstructure sensitive properties are uh, stress yield stress hardness uh, magnetic coercibility and uh, microstructure insensitive property are your uh, theoretical density elastic mode modulus theoretical density depends upon the crystal structure uh, elastic modulus depends upon in, in the inherent property of the material these are the uh, microstructure insensitive property and there are some microstructure sensitive property are that will be discussed 
coming to the classification of this material on the crystal structure we can classify all this material on uh, 32 crystal class or point group out of which there are 11 centrosymmetric and 21 are uh, non centrosymmetric so when they do when these are non centrosymmetric this non centrosymmetric materials are uh, comes comes under the uh, ferroelectric piezoelectric dielectric uh, and uh, pyroelectric property uh, are uh, observed in this uh, 21 non centrosymmetric uh, materials out of this 21 non centrosymmetric one is uh, cubic but uh, sometimes these cubic materials are also dielectric and they have also uh, ferroelectric property they so uh, Uh, but uh, with the 11 centrosymmetric material they cannot possess any polar property and they are basically paraelectric so this uh, 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 ferroelectric piezoelectric property comes under uh, 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 this dielectric or broadly you can say the dielectric uh, the, they can uh, this ferroelectric all ferroelectric materials are pyroelectric all these pyroelectric materials are piezoelectric all these piezoelectric material can be uh, said as your uh, dielectrics and so on coming to this uh, electronic classification of this material this effective uh, bonding property uh, could be uh, is important this bond decides the materials property if the there be covalent bonding and the bond energy in this range so the material become hard Uh, the, the melting point is high, and the hardness or ductility uh, hardness is this is poor. Then electrical conductivity is low. Uh, for example, we have seen the diamond, graphite, silicon, germanium. They are all covalently crystalled, uh, but they are hard. But ductility is poor. Coming to ionic crystal, where this bond energy lies between five to eleven, five to fifteen electron volt, their uh, electrical conductivity is low. There's some metallics. Their uh, bond energy lies between 0.5 to 8. Their uh, uh, electrical conductivity is high. So uh, <coughs> then, uh, under all bonds are there. Their 0.05 to 0.05 uh, uh, bond energy. Their electrical conductivity is low. So in this way, we can classify this all this material on the basis of their uh, uh, bonding property as well as your crystallographic symmetry. then uh, uh, coming to this uh, material tetrahedron this uh, uh, all these material science people they work uh, to understand this uh, uh, material tetrahedron basically uh, they uh, everybody they want to study the structure of the material then uh, what the structure is they want they know the structure they go understand the property of the material then uh, this they study the performance of the material and this all this performance are related to the structure as well property and all this performance structure property are basically depends upon the processing for example uh, this processing sometime uh, processing works i will give you one example barium titanate which is a very uh, well known uh, ferroelectric material uh, it is uh, 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 at room temperature this is tetragonal and uh, uh, c by a ratio uh, as per the crystallographic symmetry c by a ratio uh, is 1.1.08 uh, or 1.06 but uh, uh, that means there are c axis and a axis they are more or less very uh, similar they are very close to each other so that the c by a ratio is 1.06 or something like that. so <coughs> in this way uh if this c by a ratio can be changed so uh, uh by uh, changing this processing of this material if you are going to process the material as a nanoparticle or a chemical route the c by a ratio could be your uh, 1.00 uh, 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 something 00 uh, 8 0.9 009 or more than that in that case at that time this uh, property is different but once you go for the solid state synthesis processing that that time c by a ratio is 1.006 so at that time 1.006 type of the material behaves like a ferroelectric but at that time this ferroelectricity is not properly uh, 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 visible as not apparent at that time when the c by a ratio uh, uh, is closer to 1 because that become your paraelectric material so all this uh, structure uh property performance of the material depends on the processing of the materials once we can change the processing we can have a destructure property uh and its performance uh in industry 
coming to uh, this classical material there are some modern materials or smart materials where we people are uh, wondering people are working on it also there are uh, uh, well reported materials are self reporting materials they can uh, damage uh, self accumulation can lead to magnetism if self reporting then uh, if there be damage in the material then it can lead to a magnetism once you know this magnetic property has been changed so you can uh, uh, it can uh, uh, you can study you can change the replace the material that means the material will self report you that uh, this is going to damage this has been damaged once it is damaged it the magnetic property will be changed then responsive responsive are basically uh, another type of material the photochromic lens are the people are using black and white uh, uh, day and night glass lens so people say they are basically photochromic lens so when the light on, uh, falls on that lens this photon falls on the lens they are uh, reflective index or something that changes the color changes then the lens exposed to dark on on exposed to sunlight they are responsive they respond to the photo uh, photons they are called your responsive material the responsive and self healing material there if crack grows it is released to the heal the crack so the responsive and self healing materials are also there and the uh, self cleaning material these are all modern materials or smart materials then this is uh, self cleaning material so at the surface cleaning is, <coughs> is suppose we have a, a high rise building you can clean the surface glass glass surface at that time we can use some glass where they can self clean so they are, they are called a self cleaning glasses now people are working they are making uh, they are make, uh, making a paint on the this uh, uh, ceiling fans they ceiling they can self clean we don't have to clean every uh, month or every week so they are called self cleaning material self lubricating material uh, earlier this uh, uh, for any kind of uh, mechanical application uh, liquid lubricant uh, were used but uh, uh, nowadays self lubricating material are also people are uh, studying for example they are uh, aluminum graphite composite uh, they are uh, in that in this material uh, graphite basically used as a, a lubricating agent so there are uh, in addition to there are many other uh, multifunctional materials that material perform multiple roles in single structure or component for example uh, the cover of the mobile can be uh, its uh, power cell too so suppose we will be using a energy by polymer or uh, solar cell kind of thing so this uh, cover uh, can be used as a uh, or we can use as a piezoelectric material when are holding it because the power we are putting to hold it that can uh, use as the battery uh, that is and secondly it can an, an antenna made up of safe memory alloy can be uh, transported in uh, collapsed from and extended itself on healing on site and uh, invest for space application basically there uh, there set memory alloys are there uh, there antenna <coughs> and coming to the ferroelectric ferromagnetic material ferromagnetic materials and people are now as multiferroic materials they are called multifunctional materials although this uh, ferroelectric materials as comes under dielectric uh, are basically are the uh, ceramics people earlier known as ceramics are made for this floor tile but this ceramics can be now used for uh, ferromagnetic application ferroelectric application dielectric application memory application all, almost all application uh, they are called they are, we are having uh, from the ceramics they are called the multifunctional materials <coughs> coming to the uh, earlier this uh, conventional solid state physics uh, fundamental uh, of the conventional uh, material uh, physics was based on the two conceptual uh constant stones basically uh, this uh, effective single particle description or fermi liquid theory and landau symmetry breaking uh, or phase transition of the liquid they are basically come to solid state uh, physics nowadays this uh, modern uh, classification of these materials they are uh, the uh, condensed matter physics uh, we can in this condensed matter physics everything uh, is being studied uh, advanced materials uh, then strongly coated electronic system topological quantum field theory spin liquid quantum computation and information are being uh, studied on materials laser cooled atom optical uh, lattices uh, nano science and nanotechnology then spin tonics biophysics uh, all this all this uh, uh, material uh, all this field of research are comes from the condensed matter physics or uh, material science <coughs> where 
roll of materials is of prime importance this uh, the development of this social uh, this society is merely depends upon the development of the materials so that the reason uh, for the energy research people need a material which can for vibrational energy harvester they need a high visibility material for a solar cell application they need a, a good uh, solar efficient material or then uh, topological there are many things cmos application beyond cmos application single transistor application this spintonic they need materials having magnetic spin then collagen magnet resistance they need the material which having a high magnetic field uh, starting from your uh, 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 esr emr all this uh, uh, devices they need some material uh, uh, of uh, 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 improved property uh, for their uh, better now as i promised i will tell you about this uh, development of the dielectrics not that only these things are uh, only stone age bronze age uh, are there and uh, we are uh, happy up to uh, this uh, steel age and composite development or the nanoparticle but uh, this dielectrics or insulators and ceramics are also uh, contributing development of this uh, uh, modern uh, dielectrics are also contributing towards the social development <coughs> now uh, in the ancient time this in uh, 1745 the first capacitor uh, uh, was basically uh, structured by uh, constructed by uh, these two scientists uh, quenus and uh, moskenborg and this uh, uh, capacitor was known as a linden jar so <coughs> so uh, this has a very big size at that time uh, uh, actually i forgot to put the picture okay so at the very big size at that time uh, when the capacitor will be very big size you know uh, what will be the size of your mobile phone mobile phone will be of a table size so your uh, uh, computer could be of a room size at that time this was there by the development of uh, uh, this uh, uh, faraday study this insulation material uh, they name it as a dielectric and the middle of uh, 1860s the maxwell unified this electromagnetic phenomena in dielectrics that refractive index and permittivity are related like this epsilon with the permittivity is equal to uh, square of the refractive index after this many theory came are uh, this uh, uh, horse charge uh, and motis clausius dod uh, lorenz lorenz or internal field has been studied dibai also studies in 1912 the dipole moment many theory came people study this dielectric and people try to classify this uh, dielectrics and uh, uh, are of uh, uh, this type you can classify this uh, linear dielectric materials linear dielectric materials are uh, non polar dielectric and polar dielectric and polar uh, dipolar dielectrics in uh, in non polar dielectric this uh, polarization could be of uh, electronic only and uh, in case of polar dielectric the polarization could be of electronic and ionic and dipolar dielectrics this electronic uh, ionic and or orientational polarization are also to be present all this this theory all this theory are being developed on the ceramics or the dielectrics are now studied as they are non polar dielectric polar dielectric dipolar dielectric depending upon the presence of type of polarization the material in addition to that non linear dielectrics are uh, which is called the ferroelectric materials having spontaneous polarization high dielectric constants ferroelectric anti ferroelectric materials are of example uh, of this category they are called non -di linear dielectric materials they are also being uh, uh, developed because of the development of the ferroelectric and uh, uh, this uh, uh, yes uh, yes sanjeev sir shall we conclude yes i i okay i'll take 2 minutes so okay, i'm sir. quickly ferroelectric materials you know uh, non linear materials we can uh, have the application in multi layer capacitors uh, non volatile ferroelectric random access memory there are many applications coming to this energy harvesting material there are the fuel cells as uh, so where we can put uh, uh, there are energy material uh, we don't need any uh, petrol we can uh, put a fuel cell in the car and uh, it can uh, run the throughout the day so uh, this solar wind solar power in addition to this wind out, wind energy wind power this solid excited fuel cell is also important they are basically comes from the ceramics category so there are the different type of solid excited fuel cells uh, high temperature solid excited fuel cells uh, this uh, uh, there are different uh, uh, category of fuel cells uh, so okay i'll skip all this 
and finally i'll tell you how the solid cell uh, solid cell fuel cell work this is basically when this uh, ceramics are for example barium zirconite kind of sheet kind of material are doped with rare earth they uh, form a uh, tetrahedron and tetrahedron when it's hydrated this hydrogen uh, h2o comes here this is two hydrogen and oxygen uh, are being filled at this vacant place and the vacant place uh, this oxygen sometime bond with this and oxygen bond with this this one so because of this dangling uh, this uh, uh, this kind of uh, involvement hopping of this uh, protons they try to conduct electricity and this can use as a uh, solid oxide fuel cells in addition to this vibrational energy you can uh, physiology material can be used as a uh, vibrational energy harvester where we can harvest energy by putting this vibrating any sample and we can harvest energy for physiology application so this physiology application material can be used starting from your uh, any uh, quartz crystal it can be used in your uh, pacemaker also so anyway we uh, quickly have completed as for i was thinking that we uh, be getting so the keynote talk. anyway thank you all uh, if you have any questions you can ask and at last i will try to uh, uh, acknowledge the sponsors the uh, for uh, our research in our lab and the research scholars those have worked and working uh, in our group thank you all uh, thank you uh, dr sk rao sir for your uh, exceptional technical presentation so if participant have any doubts you can feel free to ask now <coughs> I hope everyone is very clear with the earlier presentation given by the professor. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for our invitation. And thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all for patient sharing. Thank you. So our inaugural plenary keynote lecture session is coming to an end now. So we are uh, moving on to the contributory oral presentations. So, uh, as part of the convenience, we have two tracks: track one and track two. Both the links are shared. Track one is here, and track two is being shared in the respective groups. So, those account, those you are presenting oral presentation, you can join to the corresponding respective tracks. So, uh, without delaying, we can start the track one contributory oral presentations now. So. Uh, the participants kindly note that you have a time restrictions of 10 minutes you should have to wind up your presentation within 7 minutes and there will be a 2 minutes for the discussion by the respected chair and co-chair chairing the session so uh, kindly be switched on to the time okay so uh, we'll start the track one session uh, Gautami how are you good morning all welcome to the conference Contributory oral presentation of iSmart 2021 Track 1. Our session will be chaired by Dr. Lijopol and Dr. Sona Narayan. Dr. Lijopol completed his PhD in Manufacturing Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and MTech in Advanced Manufacturing Engineering from NIT Suratka. He is currently working as Associate Professor and Dean Postgraduate Studies at SJCET, Pala, with 16 years teaching experience in SJCET. He is also an active member of ASME, ISTE, Society of Manufacturing Engineers and Material Research Society of India. Dr. Sona Narayanan is the Assistant Professor of FISAT for three years and have one year of teaching experience in KUSAT on Department of Applied Chemistry. She had completed her MSc in Chemistry and School of Chemical Sciences, MG University in 2006. Completed her MPhil from Department of Chemistry, Anamale University in 2008 and received PhD from KUSAT in 2015. She has extraordinarily presented several papers in many national and international conferences. She has guided many BTEC students in their projects during research periods. I welcome Dr. Lijo Sar and Dr. Sona Narayanan to this conference, first conference of ISMA 2021. Before starting the session, uh, kind instruction for the participants that there are only time limit of 10 minutes for the presentation 
and there will be alarm within seven minutes and you should have to wind up before that. So moving on to the presentation. First, we have Chin Yao Tan from Swinburne University of Technology, Sarawak Campus, Malaysia, to present a paper entitled on development of coir fiber reinforced nanocomposite for shell echo marathon vehicle body application. On to you, sir. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So just give me some time to share the screen. Sure, sir. Right, so can you all see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, we can you. see. Yep. All right, so good morning, everyone. So uh, the title of my presentation is Development of Core Fiber Reinforced Nanocomposite for Shell Eco Marathons Vehicle Body Applications. So this is one of my undergraduate student work, Tan Chin Yang, to acknowledge him and the team as well. Right, so this is the outline for this presentation. First of all, as you all aware, innovative composite material gaining more popular due to its high specific modulus, strength, chemical, and stability. This will lead to like the weight automobile and fuel saving and emissions reduction as well. This is aligned with Shell Eco Marathon competitions with the aim of producing ultra energy efficient car that is sustainable and weight saving. Although many research have been done on the composite, however, there's lacking in the nanocomposites containing silicon nanoparticle with core fiber in Shell Eco Marathon's vehicle body panel applications. So this study many focus on the weight percentage of fiber and the concentration of nanoparticle due to the available resource at the institutions right and in order to generate a good nanocomposite these are the important factor to be considered as we're aware actually fiber can uh, there are many categories of the fiber it could be natural and synthetic and it is found that the core fiber that contain higher lignin content will provide better strength performance if compared to other type of natural fiber as shown in table 1.1 right and next one there are many research also have been conducted just a pure uh, natural fiber composite typically it will increase its mechanical strength for example in tensile strength by uh, showing these three uh, example here so they involve a uh, core fiber, for example, in the, this uh, Rosa, Harris, and Obelia as well. Typically, we can see there's at least 20% of increase of the tensile strength in the natural fiber composites. Right. Next one, this is the, just a typical core fiber physical structure and properties. It has a typical length of four, four fiber is about 25 to 35 cm long. And also typically for brown core fiber, it contains higher density compared to white core fiber for research. So from the table, you can know that the brown core fiber is about 1.3 uh, gram per cubic which will give better mechanical strength as well. All right, next one is a surface modification on the fiber because natural fiber can with a lot of uh, impurity. Therefore, in order to improve the performance of it, there are typical field treatment needed. The most viable one is the chemical treatment so in table 1.2, it shows that uh, when the core polyester composite treated with alkali, typically it gives much better strength in terms of tensile, flexural, and impact strength compared to the untreated fibers. Right? Another important factor to consider is the uh, treatment time and the concentration of sodium hydroxide. Typically, it is proven that the uh, about 2% or to 5% for this sodium hydroxide give good performance uh, on the surface treatment. Right. For the identified gap of knowledge, although much research on bio-based composite were done, however, there's lacking or study on the nano composite containing silica nanoparticle with core fiber as on vehicle body panel. Therefore, this study M to determine the feasibility of core fiber reinforced nanocomposites to replace conventional material with the objective to study the relationship between the weight percentage of core fiber and the strength of core fiber reinforced nanocomposite. And these are the methods involved. 
first of all, a uh, specimen in, created in 3D parts according to ASTM D638 Type 1 models with these dimensions. The model had been modeled as a sandwich panel which consists of three ply, but the top and bottom consists of core fiber composite and the middle as silica nano composite. And the study had been conducted by SOLIDWORKS with static study together with the large displacement features were included, right? Because we can expect that this is a non-linear behavior. So, and the model had been modeled as shell elements due to its thickness, right? This is the uh, data that's needed for to model these uh, nanocomposites. And this the compositions actually comprised of core fiber, silica nanoparticle, and exposy resins based on its weight percentage. As we can observe, the silica nanoparticle contains a 5% of weight because it is proven from the previous research that 5% actually it will improve the bonding between the fiber and resin matrix. If it increase beyond that, actually it will increase the absorption rate of the water, which is not good for the composites. Next one, this is a further data for the core fiber composite and silica nanocomposite. The data which is extracted from the previous researchers. So especially for equation one, is calculated based on uh, for the density for core fiber composites. So with this data in, in inserted, then we apply the boundary condition where left hand side is a fixed geometry that we try to mimic the real life experiments. And the right hand side is the applied force that ranging from 100 Newton to 1000 Newton forces with an increment of 100 Newton for the three, star, three samples that I just showed, 5, 7.5, and 10% of the weight loading for the core fiber reinforced nanocomposites. All right. And the result and discussion. The result basically actually is uh, showing the maximum the magnitude of the, of the result shoulder. So first of all, we have a look at the effect of the applied force toward one minus stress. It is observed that the uh, nanocomposites, the content of 10% core fiber is outperformed compared to the 5% weight composite for the core fiber because actually it's experienced lower one minus stress compared to the 5% loading. Similarly, goes to the effect of applied force toward displacement of the sample and the strain as well. So as we look at the graph, we can observe that the nanocomposite fiber with 10% loading is experiencing lower displacement and strength as well. Therefore, we can, through this graph, observe that the basically this proposed nanocomposite is indicate its viability to withstand the minimum characteristic strength that is 250 megapascal. Right. And verification. Uh, sir, is... sorry for interruption. Uh, kindly conclude your uh, presentation, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Verification results have been done too, just to verify the medical model had been applied correctly at the correct locations. So at the show graph show that actually it is uh, fulfilled the requirement that is close to zero percent of the error. And a linear relationship had been applied for the ten percent loading core fiber cases as well has been established to find the relationship between applied force, resultant displacement, the strength, and the maximum one wises. Conclusions. It is proven that from this numerical study, the higher weight percentage of core fiber increases the tensile strength of this nanocomposite material. However, the limitation is uh, experimental data needed to validate this uh, numerical result. Thank you, for everyone, for your time. Yep. Okay, back to you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Questions? Uh, Lijo, sir, the session uh, is open to you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. I have uh, two questions to the presentation. Mm -hmm. One is uh, you have, you have shown a uh, ANSYS diagram uh, that a uh, modeling diagram. So have you used any mesh size? Uh, is it uh, uh, mesh optimized or you have uh, randomly selected any mesh for your uh, tensile testing? 
Yeah, so maybe if I show my screen again, basically, I think you ask about the mesh size, is it? The mesh size actually is applied in between with about 20 mm for the element size. However, in order to verify the metabolic models applied in the model, so it reduced by half in every iterations. So as you can see from the iteration of four, compared to three, actually is close to 0% already uh, for the differences. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that is 1.25. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that is a, it's a machine independent study, that's why you are done there. Yeah, this is just for verification for the mathematical apply at the, uh, the region. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing is, uh, are you planning to use any optimization tools to once you get the external data with you? Are you planning to do any uh, optimization for your experimentation? Uh, actually, to be very honest, so this is one of my undergraduate work. So, uh, it's because right now, as you're aware, now it's because of the this COVID pandemic. So it'd be quite challenging to uh, do this work sometimes. But I think it's a good suggestion. So I think yeah, maybe could further uh, maximize for optimization for this work. Because then only you can put a final results for uh, which is the best combination for your experimentation work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the uh, suggestions. Yeah. Probably. Okay, 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 thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, sir. Yes. Hello. Hello. So, uh, what kind of plasticity model is used for uh, this chiral composite? Uh, again, sorry. Uh, the the plas If you want to find out the failure for this plasticity model, what kind of model or what, what failure oh. criteria is used for this one? Uh, for this one, I think it's used the uh, uh, core plasticity one minus model. Okay, but basically it is I feel something. Uh, so one minus means it's for the uh, isotropic material, is it? Again, sorry, I can't hear the second part. Eh? Uh, so actually, uh, one minus uh, can we use I hill instead of one minus because um, one minus is dedicated for uh, isotropic material. Mm -hmm. Is yep. there any uh, complication in that? Uh, yeah, it could be in that way, but yeah, as you're aware, actually, yeah, this is the using the uh, okay. assume the plant material is isometric properties. Yeah. Okay, isometric. Okay, okay, sure. okay. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you for the presentation. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chin Yo Tan. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, you have used starch, ethylene, uh, vinyl, alcohol, coir, biocomposites as materials, right? Instead of polyester. Uh, could you please explain any treatment methods uh, for uh, you uh, for coir fiber for composite preparation? Uh, for this study, right? So the treatment, the student year, I think he used the alkaline treatments. Oh, you have used alkaline treatments uh, yep. to remove the protein contents. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. And and also you have told that uh, while adding coir fiber, mechanical pro properties improved a lot. Can you explain uh, the reason for it? Can you explain the reason? Okay. Yeah. So the test actually is done according to the ASTM D six three specimen, and you try to. Uh, test the tensile strength of the material so by incrementally increases uh, the magnitude of the force from 110 to 1000 yeah so because yep uh yep this is one of the reason uh the study have been carried out actually uh uh, uh when the pandemic just come in hit in so the student actually completed almost 70 percent 60 percent so therefore uh he switched to these uh, mathematical modelings yeah but the reason why I apply the force is to try to mimic the experiment to uh, get the tensile strength of this material. Okay. Uh, any uh, any possibility of secondary interactions like that? Uh, say donut uh, or polar interactions between uh, quiet fiber and uh, starch, ethylene, vinyl, alcohol? Uh, sorry, is the possibility of secondary interactions like uh, dipole interactions between coir fiber um, and uh, uh, ethylene vinyl alcohol? Is there any possibility? 
the possibility to use other treatment, is it? Ah, yes, you have uh, conducted alkyl treatment for mm -hmm. uh, Yep. Coil fiber to mm -hmm. for the preparation of composites, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, after uh, uh, after treatment, is there any possibility of secondary interactions like uh, dipole interactions between uh, coil fiber and uh, silica resin? Uh, it could be, yeah, it could be do that as well. Yep, definitely. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Thank you, Kok Hing Chong, sir, uh, for the wonderful research presentation. Thank you. Yep. Moving on to the second presentation, we have Archana Nair from IISER Tirunanthapuram to present a paper entitled on large area coverage and controlled photoluminescence from vertically aligned zinc oxide nanorods on copper substrates. On to you, ma'am. Uh, hi, actually, Archa couldn't be here for some reason, so it's when I hear who's presenting. So I'll just be sharing my screen. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a minute. Good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, okay, I hope you can see my screen. This is yes. the presentation, and then we here we go. Okay, so uh, the work which we are going to present today is for our, uh, it was Acha's master's thesis uh, on large area coverage of uh, zinc oxide nanorods, which are grown uniformly uh, over a large area and uh, controlled photoluminescence from the same. And uh, these are non trivially grown on uh, copper substrates, which is very difficult to actually stick to something. Uh, anyways, so uh, just to give a brief introduction, myself, Dr. Vinayak Kamble, I'm from ISA Trivandrum. I'm a faculty at physics department, and uh, we here we are for this iSmart conference. Uh, the outline of the talk goes as follows. Uh, we inter give you a brief introduction of zinc oxide and it's uh, the way the rods have been prepared. Uh, they are characterized. A uh, bit of uh, information about uh, optoelectronic properties of these things. What do we mean by controlled photoluminescence? How is it going to be used? And uh, anything allied with that if time permits. And uh, finally, I shall conclude. So zinc oxide, many of us would be knowing. Actually, it's very versatile material. It's actually... Uh, it's. Uh, it shows a variety of properties, as many of the speakers just now were mentioning, non centrosymmetric space group, very wide band gap. It has uh, very large tunability in the band gap, defect, uh, rich defect structure, defects leading to various other properties, excitonic binding energies, and so on and so forth. It is very stable chemically and thermally. I mean, you heat it to high temperature in an oxidizing atmosphere, nothing happens, and so on and so forth. So, and above all, it is very easy to prepare. Uh, there's very little mistake that one can do while making ZNO. So, uh, uh, what does it being used for? Variety of purposes, various semi sensors for electrical sensors or electrochemical sensors, uh, field emitters, field emitter guns, uh, battery storage electrodes, uh, photocatalysts. I can just go on naming it uh, various devices, photovoltaics, and so on and so forth. And one of which we are going to see for the solid state lightning today. Uh, the rods were prepared by wet chemical method. First of all, uh, some solution of zinc acetate was drop casted. Uh, zinc acetate was dissolved in ethanol, and certain concentration was drop casted on copper substrate. And uh, it was spin coated and then heated to a reasonably little temperature of uh, baked at around 300 degrees just to form small nuclei of ZNO. And these uh, nuclei are like uh, further treated. Uh, with uh, the solution of zinc nitrate hexahydrate at around 95 degrees with HMTA, hexamethylene tetramine, in, a, in that solution along with some uh, reference electrode like platinum, and the rods were grown by uh, electrochemical processes. Okay, so uh, initially a certain amount of 2.73 volt was applied to it, then it was reduced uh, and it was continued up to a certain time of 15. So we see how as the time proceeds, how does these rods grow? 
and what happens to the crystallinity of these rod and what also happens to the elect uh, optical properties of these rods so uh, various uh, rods uh, I mean samples were deposited for different times 3 minutes 5 minutes 10 minutes and 15 minutes and uh, then uh, these samples were studied for various characterizations as you can see here the 3 minutes rods which were grown they are nearly something which is like particles sitting on a uh, on a substrate and uh, we, we here in the inset, we are showing the contact angle measurement, which basically shows the wettability of the substrate. And you can see the contact angle is quite obtuse. It is around more than 100 degrees or so on and so forth. Uh, as the time increases, uh, certain growth of the rods were seen by five minutes. And uh, the, the contact angle was reduced, but not significantly. It was more or less practically the same. For 10 minutes, um, rods were quite consequence uh, uh, i mean they were quite uh, higher in size dimensions and also the wettability of the surface actually had increased and by 15 minutes it had completely covered with the rods and uh, they were quite taller and uh, the surface was uh, because of the nano structurization it was quite uh, wettable so uh, the contact angle uh, was reduced substantially so what do we see? We see as the time increases, the rod length was increased, not, uh, the surface wettability had increased, more uniform coverage area was observed. And uh, what is the area which we are talking about? We have even deposited something over the diameter of like five centimeter in diameter. So uh, that was uh, the kind of coverage we are talking about. And it's very difficult to get such a uniform coverage over such a large area. Uh, so the X-ray diffraction, you can see as the time increases, initially there was absolutely no peak seen, more or less because of the poor crystallinity of the initial seeds. As uh, the time increased, some of the peaks of ZNO were appearing and by 15 minutes, there was a nice a sharp peaks of uh, certain reflections of ZNO. And these were identified for the prismatic planes of ZNO which are like dominant in the, uh, this thing. So this structure was uh, optimized and uh, you can see the cross-sectional SEM, it is like completely uh, cover uh, covering the entire substrate for a, a wider uh, area. And uh, then we studied the photoluminescence properties. Just to give you an introduction for the students, what is photoluminescence? Luminescence is essentially absorption and energy and uh, re-emission of the same through various processes. The excitation can be various things. It can be chemoluminescence, electroluminescence, photoluminescence, and so on. Depending on the stimulus, we call it as what kind of luminescence it is. So in this case, it is photoluminescence. That means the excitation was done by light. And this, uh, once it is excited by more than the band gap value of that particular material, uh, the, uh, the charge carriers which are generated, the electron hole pair, they can actually recombine from that excited state back uh, after a given certain lifetime of that particular level. Or they might actually also uh, de-excite to another uh, metastable level from where they can actually de-excite either by radiatively or by non-radiative transitions. So what do we see? We see that the photoluminescence spectrum actually changes quite uh, significantly at each stages. You can see three nanometer. Uh, I would say this is almost uh, having emission for all the wavelength, all the visible uh, entire spectrum. As you see, uh, the five minute deposited sample actually shows a very large visible uh, emission at around 500 and 600 nanometers, whereas there is something which is peaking up at around 370 nanometers. Uh, for 10 minutes, it is more of uh, both the peaks are refined and you also see some of the peaks which are at uh, in between the two. These are at around 300 nanometers, uh, sorry, 400 nanometers. And then for the 15 minute, which is highly crystalline uh, nano rods, you see very large emission from the UV part than the visible. So the UV emission has, uh, has kind of increased at the cost of the visible one. So we attribute this UV emission to the band to band emission from valence to the conduction uh, excitation and emission is from conduction to valence, which is nearly 3.3 .3 electron. Uh, nine, sir. Uh, yes, uh, time is, just, uh, just concluding conclude. last slide. Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, sir. Okay. okay. Yes, and then uh, the visible one comes from the defect one. So people can refer to this paper uh, if they are interested in. So what do we show? That uh, the luminescence can be very uh, nicely controlled. 
and we also found out the color uh, co temperature of the emission and we found that uh, the 10 minute deposited sample showed very uh, close to a high uh, color rendering index and very nice uh, this thing so i'll just conclude this uh, talk by summarizing some of the key points one is uh, we have grown zno nano rods on copper substrate of different length about different times and uh, with increasing the rod length we increase the, uh, the surface wettability increase the optoelectronic properties change significantly and the best cri was obtained for 10 minute deposited rod these are references these are acknowledgements and thank you for your attention and uh, thanks uh, this is my email A any of the students wants to get in touch they are more than welcome thank you so much thank you vinayak sir thank you for the wonderful presentation the session is given queries to the chair yeah uh, one question uh, to the presentation sure. Yeah, uh, you have told about 10 minutes uh, is the best condition. How do you reach that conclusion? Uh, that yeah, so uh, you see that the spectrum actually cover, covers the entire uh, visible uh, as well as the this region. So for uh, so, so as to have a white light emission, you need to have contribution from red, blue, green, all of these. So uh, what happens is there are these defects which show up for 10 minutes, which are optimum. They are not too high so as to mask the uh, uv part or they are not too low so as to have dominant uv part so there is an optimum balance which is stuck at around 10 minute deposition and that has uh, emissions over the entire visible range and that's how you have near white light emission which you can actually i i just skipped through this part but you can decipher that from the uh, the cri color uh, temperatures and the plot uh, where it is closing to that Planckian distribution so, and so on. Yeah, what is the range in which you vary? What is the time duration you have checked in the left side and right side? How much maximum, how much minimum time you have kept for this deposition? Uh, of uh, what? For, for the yeah. deposition or for the measurement? Yeah, deposition. deposition. That was, uh, so minimum was starting from 3 minutes all the way till 15 minutes. So uh, by 15 minutes, we saw that it is very crystalline. The defects were nearly minimized. OK, thank you. Yep. OK. Uh, any more? Did you no, see any no. difference on the DK time? We didn't do the time resolved uh, PL, actually. So uh, one, one should do that and uh, to see how what is the kind of, uh, how long does it actually does. But uh, you know, that is why I said this exciton energy for ZNO is very large. So it takes very large, longer time to break this exciton once it is formed. So it actually results in very longer uh, uh, emissions. So just to quote the number, I, I expect it would be something close to uh, nanoseconds uh, or something like that. Okay. Actually, nanoseconds are very fast, right? Uh, depends for uh, like it depends from the system to system. So here, I would say uh, nano. You would get something which is going very uh, close, uh, picosecond sharp, uh, whatever decay. But uh, here, it it lasts a little longer than that. So it's all relative. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any more queries? Okay. Uh, I guess there are no. Uh, Sir. Yes. Have you measured uh, quantum heat for these samples? Uh, you mean EQE? No, we haven't done yet. Done those things. Oh. No. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank no. you. Thank you so much, sir, for such an informative presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next presentation, we have Satish Kumaki from Sri Shiva Subramanya Nadar College of Engineering, Kalavakam, Chennai, presenting on the paper entitled on Polymeric Materials for Electromagnetic Shielding. On to you, sir. Satish, sir.
am i audible yes you are audible yes. you can call the next person okay i think there is some network issue with him okay moving on to the next presentee we have rakhav gr from scms college of engineering and technology karkuti presenting on the topic synthesis and characterization of co5 cr rha hybrid composite using powder metallurgy on to you sir good, good morning one all let me where i am audible ma'am hello good morning yes sir you are audible uh, whether my slides are visible now yes it's visible Sure. Good morning. Myself, Dr. J. R. Raghav. I am uh, currently working as associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, SCMS College of Engineering and Technology, Ernakulam. Um, I am going to present a topic on synthesis and characterization of cobalt five percent chromium RHA rice as cash hybrid composite fabricated using powder metallurgy process. Abstract: <clears throat> the the powder metallurgy was used to create. cobalt uh, chromium rice cash hybrid composites uh, in this in this research work and the rha ash powders are synthesized using furnace we have heated the rice as cash to 700 degrees celsius so as to convert it into a ash ash material uh, then the surface morpho morphology of the composite materials is uh, characterized using scanning ultra microscope and the results shows that Uh, the, um, due to the RHA reinforcement, the micro hardness of the composite increased by 8 uh, percentage. The density of the composite has decreased due to the soft re RHA reinforcement. Whereas the comparison strength of the co cobalt chromium 10 percentage RHA showed 130 megapascal, which, which has increased by 4 percentage compared to other composite materials. Then uh, we have uh, subjected the composite to wear analysis, where um, the form and the oxides present in the RHA has Reduce the wear loss significantly, and also due to the formation of triboxide layers, the and the primary wear mechanism is abrasive wear, which is identified using some analysis. The corrosion behavior of the cobalt five percent chromium RHA hybrid composites was investigated using electrochemical oxidation in the presence of three percent NaCl electrolytic solution. Of all the specimens, ten uh, percent uh, rice uh, ash hybrid composites. Have stronger recall value of about minus zero point eight one two volts. So uh, directly, I am going to the um, uh, result and discussion. Um, the composite materials are uh, the, the fabricated using powder metallurgy process, in which all the base the base material cobalt, chromium, and RHA has been uh, ball milled using high energy ball mill. The ball milling, uh, milling was carried out for about. Uh, Five hours, so as to uh, obtain uniform, uh, uh, uniform and uh, uniform blending of the composite materials with uh, reinforcements. Then the powdered samples are then characterized using some uh, FPSM in order to study the surface morphology. So in this process, um, up the FPSM figure shows that the RHA and has uh, good binding with the cobalt chromium matrix materials. Uh, we can see that uh, we can see that the RHA is uh, is um, agglomerated. The RHA the figure three shows the RHA particles, which is uh, uh, found to be agglomerated, and it has uh, some pores. Uh, so, and also in the fourth may uh, in the figure D, we can see that the, there is uniform agglomeration of the reinforcements with the matrix materials. Then, after the characterizing these powders. Then uh, we converted this powder composite materials into a green compact by compressing the composite powders using universal testing machine at about 500 megapascal pressure, so as to obtain a green compact. So then green compact is heated at around 700 degrees Celsius to convert it to a hard composite materials. So that hard composite materials then is, is subject to various mechanical testings such as micro hardness and density. So in um, so in the, uh, in the first figure, one shows the micro hardness and the comparison within compressive strength. Here it is evident that the micro hardness of the uh, composite materials increases slightly with the um, increase in RHA particles. Similarly, the compressive strength also increases with the increase in uh, RHA reinforcement. Actually, this 
the increase in comp- uh, micro hardness is is is, uh, is, is uh, due to the uh, hard and uh, uh, the brittle nature of the rhc particles uh, whereas uh, the, the density um, also uh, drastically has increased in this in this study in the uh, second image sorry the composite strength has uh, increased whereas the density of the composite materials has decreased uh, considerably with the increase in uh, 10% rhc particles because uh, the, uh, the density of chromium cobalt and chromium is much more higher than the rhc so obviously with the increase in 10% of rhc the density of the composite materials has reduced considerably and it is around uh, 7 grams per uh, centimeter cube for the cobalt 5% uh, and the 10% rhc uh, composite materials so um it is obvious that even though there is a decrease in density the microorganisms and the compressive strength of the composite materials has improved considerably in this study this is due to the uh, oxide layers and oxides present in the uh, rh particles are on the rh and consist of in the in this study it is uh, from the xrd analysis it is confirmed that um, rh has major constituent of sio to silicon dioxide which is a major uh, reason uh, the, uh, for the improvement in the microorganisms intensity sorry composition then the composite materials are subject to uh, wear and co uh, analysis uh, tribological analysis the wear study shows that the, the rh powder the reinforcement of rh powder has reduced the uh, wear, uh, wear loss in, uh, in at various study conditions in the figure one shows at a constant load uh, at a constant load of uh, 10 newton sliding distance of 1.5 meter and sliding distance 1000 meter it has uh, uh, it has incurred a very minimal loss uh, cobalt 5% and 10% rh has incurred very minimal weight loss compared to the other combinations there uh, are the cof value also uh, uh, authenticate the same same uh, trend it shows that the cof values of the cobalt 5 percentage chromium 10 percent rh has reduced to around 0.47 percent 0.47 compared to that of 0.68 of our cobalt 5 percentage chromium 2.5 percentage rh composite materials so uh, it is obvious the reason behind this is due to the formation of oxide tribal layers at the surface of the composite materials as well as the presence of uh, oxides such as sio2 in the composite material which improve this corrosion uh, this wear uh, resistance so uh, this is a same image uh, for the wear and wear analysis uh, from the, there is a sliding track uh, the, from the direction it is on, it is understood that the wear mechanism is abrasive wear there are some pull outs from the uh, from the specimen uh, there are uh, from the study some analysis there is no uh, evidence of uh, adhesive wear uh, the main wear mechanism is abrasive wear um, so the uh, from the wear tracks it is uh, obvious that the main uh, mechanism is abrasive wear then finally the last study which we carried out is cor- corrosion electrochemical corrosion analysis uh, raka sir kindly conclude your presentation uh, thank you sir thank you so in con- as a conclusion a summary Um, so this uh, composite material cobalt five percent chromium rh composite is fabricated using photometry process as compared to other combinations uh, cobalt five percent uh, chromium and 10 percent rh hybrid composite has a uh, 200 205 hv uh, hardness uh, which is improved uh, drastically then uh, the composite strength also increased to 130 mega pascal compared to about 125 mega pascal for cobalt uh, high chromium 2.5 percent rh hybrid composite materials so the density of the composite materials has uh, reduced considerably with addition of rh particles the wear resistance of the composite materials has improved considerably with, in- with the increase in uh, rh content the uh, electrochemical corrosion analysis also shows that uh, with the increase in uh, rh reinforcement uh, the corrosion resistance has improved considerably so time from this i am concluding my uh, speech uh, thank you for giving me opportunity thank you Thank you, sir. Thank you for the very good work. Uh, now this session is given queries to the chair. Yeah. What is the powder method that they are using in this process? What method? So I can get you, sir. Hello. 
Hello. What is the type of powder metallurgy you have used in this process? It's a, it actually it's a dry powder metallurgy. It's a normal, just uh, classical metal, uh, classical powder metallurgy process. Means uh, how? What is the procedure you are used? Uh, actually, uh, we create a dye, sir. In, in this dye, we have uh, uh, the composite mixture, which is uh, which we carry, uh, which we carried out using using ball milling process. It's fed into that uh, dye, and it is compressed using a um, UTM machine. Uh, um, so after compressing, we will get a green compact. The green compact is sintered in order to add in the composite material. So this is uh, then. Yeah, what, it, yeah, yeah. what then, is the sintering condition you use? Pressure, temperature, which was sintering? Uh, for sintering, we, we, we used around 900 degrees Celsius, sir. For a uh, compaction vessel, we, we have maintained 500 megapascal uh, to okay. compaction. Um, so sintering temperature is a trial and error method. Sometimes, uh, if you go below that, uh, there will be no hotness. If you go above that uh, 950 degrees Celsius, there is formation of cracks. So I have um, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, done various experiments and uh, concluded that 900 degrees Celsius uh, is best for uh, synthetic temperature for this composite material. Yeah, have you studied any metallurgical part of this? How that uh, sintering happens? Is it diffusion or any other process? Uh, how they join together? So no, so I didn't uh, study that aspect, sir. In this yeah, why you consider 10 uh, RHA, why not uh, 15 or why not 5? Actually, in, in my previous work, I have gone uh, gone be, uh, till 35% uh, uh, is uh, where, uh, where uh, above, going above 25% is, has reduced the properties, all the mechanical properties. Uh, so that's why I, uh, in this study, I have uh, studied from uh, 25 to 10%. Is. Okay, thank you. Any more queries? Okay, if there are no more queries, thank you, Rakhav, sir, for thank you, thank sharing you. such informative work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Moving you. on to the next, next presentee, we have Harish K. from NSS College of Engineering, Palakkad, to present the paper entitled on influence of process parameters of wire EDM on surface finish of TI6AL4V. On to you, Harris, sir. Uh, okay. of iridium on surface finish of TA6L4V. I hope I am audible. Yes, you are audible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, audible. Yeah, okay. These are the contents of our work. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. First of all, we will, get in, we will give an introduction. So, we selected TA6L4V for our study, which is an alloy of titanium, uh, aluminum, and vanadium, which offers very a uh, high strength to weight ratio and also high machinability, high ductility, uh, low density, high biocompatibility, etc. So it has a lot of such a great properties uh, which makes it of greater commercial value. But uh, still its applications are limited due to its cost and poor machinability with the conventional machining operation. So because of its hardness, we require some advanced machining operations uh, to machine TA6L4V. Uh, so Varadium is uh, such an advanced machining operation. Uh, also, Varadium is a rival replacement for uh, outmoded machining methods to cut nickel-based, titanium-based alloys and hardened alloys. That uh, non-contact nature of this Varadium uh, makes, uh, uh, makes it an advantage uh, because the hardness of the material is not an issue for a Varadium uh, because of that non-contact nature. Uh, so we selected Varadium uh, to machine TA6L4V in our study. And these are the objectives of study. So the main objective is actually to uh, study the influence of process parameters of, of viridium on surface roughness. Uh, so actually, the problem is actually TA6L4V and viridium. Both are causally material and process. So we need to minimize the wastage of material and minimize the post-finishing operations. So that we need to optimize the machining operations. So the experiment is designed based on a full factorial design. And uh, 
uh, it includes selection of process parameters and fixing of their levels. So we selected three process parameters and then their levels are uh, also fixed. So this is done purely based on literature survey and expert's opinion and previous experiment results. So we did a trial and error method uh, to select the process parameters and to fix their levels. Also, some parameters have correlation with some non-selected parameters so that uh, we thought that this parameter will get uh, the best results for our study and the experiment is conducted uh, based on full factorial design and uh, it is a machine with variadium and then surface roughness parameters uh, which are ra rq rp rv rz are measured using a 3d optical profilometer and then the individual effects of process parameters on surface roughness is plotted using software mini tab and finally it is optimized to get the best surface finish within the operating limits so these are the setup uh, so uh, we have to deal with two machines in our study uh, which are a uh, variadium and an optical profilometer so that we so the EDM that we used is actually Concord Variadium DK7720 with a molybdenum di a wire of 0.2 mm diameter and we selected deionized water as a dielectric fluid and then the operating parameters. So the machine is capable of uh, operating with two levels of voltage which is a low voltage uh, a 75 volt DC and a high voltage of 100 volt DC and it is able to uh, uh, operate with four levels of air speed which are level 0, 1, 2 and 3. So 0 is the highest speed and 3 is the lower speed but we selected uh, uh, where speed 2 and 3 because uh, operating variadium at a very high speed for TA6L4V is not a good choice because of that hardness of TA6L4V it may lead to the breakage of fire so we selected where speed 2 uh, which is 700 rpm and where speed 3 which is 280 rpm and then feed rate is selected from 30 hertz to 150 hertz uh, with the five levels so one hertz means one pulse per second and one pulse implies one micron feed and then we selected 3D 3D optical profilometer uh, with a tungsten halogen lamp and a 5x objective lens and 2x field of view lens and the software used VicoVision software uh, and the measurement technique is optical phase shifting and white light vertical scanning interferometry which is VSI and then these are details of study so initially we had a big piece of TA6L4V of size 200 mm by 35 mm by 5 mm and then process parameters are selected which is feed rate wire speed and voltage uh, which we already discussed and then the experiment is designed with the full factorial design uh, and then the material removal operation so the given sample is cut into four pieces of size 60 mm by 15 mm by 5 mm and surface of each sample is machined with a variadium by sampling length of 10 mm and depth of 0.15 mm so each sampling length is machined with different operating parameters which are a different voltage wire speed and uh, uh, feed rate combination so there's on each side five samples are obtained and these sam and these machine surface are used to measure the uh, surface roughness parameters uh, using a 3D non contact optical profilometer uh, such as RA, RQ, RZ, RP, and RV. And topography of the surface is also obtained using an optical stereo microscope. So these are some of the images uh, that we uh, work with. And then these are the results. Uh, so we measured. Uh, five different surface roughness parameters so so this is why because each roughness parameters has significance on different applications so for that roughness average is actually used to describe the roughness of machine surface for a non-complex surfaces uh, so from the plot it was clear that surface roughness increases with increase in feed rate so this is actually a common trend for most of the machining operation and when it comes to wire speed uh, at a constant wire speed, RA values are high at low voltage, and similarly at constant voltage, RA values tend to increase with a uh, decrease in wire speed. So the same result repeats in every roughness parameters measurement, but there may be some exceptions. And then RMS roughness. So RMS roughness is used to uh, describe the finish of optical surfaces. So RQ values also gives the same results as that of RA value, but there is a small exception at a feed rate of 60 hertz which is at a high voltage and wire speed to rq values more apart from this point rq values are more at low voltage and a low wire speed and feed rate uh, have same results as that of ra so rz values also give same results as, as that of rq which is apart from the point 60 hertz it gives same results as that of rq and at a 60 hertz rz values more at high voltage and wire speed too uh, so rz values are used to uh, measure the surface texture of small valve seats such as peaks or valleys have functional significance and then uh, maximum peak height rp so rp is used to analyze the surface based on peaks uh, so variation of rp is also 
uh, quite similar to RQ and RZ. Uh, that is at 60 hertz, RP value is more at high voltage and uh, where speed to combination. Uh, other than that, it also gives same results that of roughness average and uh, and then RV. So RV is used on a surface based on valleys. So wettability is actually a function of RV. Uh, so wettability can also be uh, measured using RV. Uh, and the result is also repeats, uh, uh, which is valid up increases with increase in feed rate. And it uh, concludes the same. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, so finally, the optimization, so roughness average will be best to op uh, optimize because of the roughness average can describe the roughness of machine surface. So when it comes to process parameters, which are voltage, wire spread, and feed rate, so voltage has very less significance or influence on process on roughness average, and wire speed has a better uh, influence on roughness average. Uh, so roughness average increases with uh, a decrease in wire speed, and roughness average uh, increases with uh, a feed rate. So best surface finish happens at lower feed rate. So this is because of the fact that machine gets enough time to flush out the evaporated material from the surface. So conclusion, so optimize the process parameter combination is a 30 hertz feed rate, which is 1.8 mm per minute, uh, where speed to which is 100 rpm, and high voltage 100 volt DC. And the image of the profilometer is also uh, attached with the slide. And there are a lot of other parameters that can also influence surface reference property. So we can also extend the study with uh, including those parameters also. Also, we can study the wettability of some lubricant on the surface of TS6L4V uh, to, uh, to study the uh, suitability of TS6L4V for moving parts of machine. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Harris, sir. Thank you for sharing such an excellent paperwork. Now, the session is given thank to Harris to the chair. Yeah, uh, actually, very well done this work. We done this work at the AAC Bangalore, sir. AAC Bangalore. Both setups are there. That's a yeah. parameter and the uh, wiring. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the dielectric you use there? Sorry, sir. Dielectric liquid you have used, which one? Uh, sir, we use DNAs to water. DA water. And what is the diameter of your wire you have used? Which is 0.3 mm diameter, uh, molybdenum wire. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, why, uh, you have used only this uh, main uh, effect force, or uh, have you done any optimization for this? Yeah, we did optimization also by uh, using mini type software, and we got the result that lower feed rate and higher wear speed, uh, uh, higher so voltage. What, what, what method you used in the what method you used in the mini tab? Uh, we this used that a full factor of design, and then uh, from that there is a optimization tab that we can use to uh, minimize surface roughness and then by uh, using that method we optimized okay, okay. Uh, so you are you are concerned only on surface finish no other parameters yes sir uh, because for iridium uh, only one output uh, there are many other outputs you can measure right uh, like uh, material do more or uh, maybe some other uh, yeah actually sir we plan to uh, measure the wettability also, uh, but due to uh, this pandemic, we couldn't complete our project uh, so that we could. Uh, so, we need to limit that study. That's what is what, the total number uh, of experiments you conducted? So, sir, what is the total number of experiments you have conducted? A total 27? of 20 samples that we got 20 samples. 20, 20 experiments yeah. you have completed. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah because if for 20 experiments with you, I think you can go for some other uh, rather than going to the uh, this uh, mean effects you can go to some other optimization tools because your results yes. will be better with uh, better tools if you have yes, 20 sir, thank you for yes sir yes because this is not accepted anywhere if you put a this manifest force or somewhere or if you go for some good works uh, these are only the fundamentals yes, what you have shown so yes, you are a bit student yes sir okay I'll pass out with 2020 batch okay okay yeah, it's a good work uh, from the VTEC level. Uh, but uh, you can, if you for the think of any MTEC level, so uh, you just uh, try to study some more optimization tools. If you are 20 experience, don't uh, put the results in that. Go further. Yeah. Yes, sir, we will. Yeah, thank you. Try. Okay. Thank you. Any more queries? So thank you, Harry, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Moving on to the next presentation.
we have Gibin George from SEMS School of Engineering and Technology, Karukuti, presenting his paper on dispersion analysis of nanofillers and its relationship to the properties of the nanocomposites. On to you, Gibin, sir. So, good morning, ma'am. Uh, my name is Amal, Amal Pide. I am one of the co authors of that paper. Uh, shall I present? Okay, okay, sir, you can. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I hope my uh, slide is visible. Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay. So good afternoon. Uh, so our paper is on the dispersion analysis of nanofillers and its relationship to the properties of the nanocomposites. Okay. So uh, maybe with uh, Dr. Jibin George, uh, my co-author, is present here for uh, presenting this paper. So uh, for we all know that addition of nanomaterials uh, in polymer uh, matrices is extensively used for uh, refining the thermal mechanical flame resistance and electrical characteristics, characteristics of polymer matrices. So here we have made an attempt to correlate the dispersion and distribution of fillers with uh, the crystalline and mechanical properties of the composites. For our study, we have taken evaco or polyethylene covinyl acetate co-carbon monoxide, also known as alveloid 492 for us a uh, polymer composite, and halosage nanotube as the filler. So uh, about the polyethylene uh, covinyl acetate co-carbon monoxide, evaco. Um, it is a semi-crystalline polymer, also known as alveoli 4924, used as a plasticizer for uh, PVC. It has good uh, addition to uh, polar surfaces. It has the ability to form the uh, thin layers and is ideal as uh, addition promoters uh, in paints and coatings. And also uh, our filler material, halosate nanotube, uh, is uh, formed by weathering of aluminum silicate uh, clay. Then, uh, Crystal structure has a tetrahedral SiO4 at the corners and octahedral aluminum oxide at the edges. And uh, as SiO4 and uh, aluminum uh, oxides are arranged in sequence and water molecules are presented between these layers. So applications are in uh, control re release of drugs and protective agents, then fillers in composites, emuls emulsifiers, organic pollutants, sorbents, etc. So let us discuss how we have uh, uh, prepared this composite. This halosite nanotube uh, in uh, dichloromethane is mixed with evaco using magnetic stirring. Then uh, the evaco plus HNT plus DCM mixture is undergone and ultrasonication to form this composite films. So coming to the resultant discussion, uh, we have done the scanning electron microscopy and energy dispersion X-ray spectroscopy. Then um, this elemental uh, mapping is done. As, we, as you can see, these white dots represent the HND particles. Uh, and you can see the closed particles under dilation. OK, these, uh, these, are, these are the um, SEM images uh, where we have added 1 percentage, then 3 percentage, 5 percentage, and 7 percentage. Then 10 percentage of HND is added uh, to the polymer composite. And this is the dispersion of HNTs using sparse sampling technique. Um, uh, first, we have uh, we have using this aluminum elemental map here, and we have converted uh, uh, converted this mapping into binary images, or uh, we have converted the map to a grayscale a binary image. Then, uh, then uh, we have uh, divided this into twenty equal parts. 20 equal uh, samples, and uh, the number of particles in each area was counted with the help of image J. Okay. So the degree of homogeneity in homogeneity is measured as standard deviation using this equation. Sigma is equal to root of 1 by n in the summation of i, uh, n a i minus n a whole square, where n a i is the observed number of inclusions per unit area in the i location, and n a is the average number of particles in unit area. Uh, uh, these are the analysis uh, we have done. The, the average number of particles per unit area for filler loading is uh, uh, measured, and the graph is uh, from this graph we can see that uh, 85, uh, around 85 actual numbers are shown in one percentage of uh, filler loading. 
so uh, for the, from the standard deviation graph is also shown here and actually here for when the one percentage of uh, filler loading is uh, added we got an 85 uh, number 85 act, actual number is 85 when we counted using the image j and uh, for uh, we expected uh, expect an outcome or uh, output uh, expected number for each percentage of allocate nanotube uh, concentration uh, addition is for one percentage it is 85 so we have uh, we we have to get for three percentage 85 into three 85 into this uh, filler loading but uh, so so that we will get we have to get an expected number of 85 255 425 595 and 850 but uh, this is the actual number we we get uh, for one percentage we got 85 for three percentage we got 90 98 then five percentage we got 99 so seven percentage 89 and 10 percentage 80 and we have uh, calculated the sample deviation and for one percentage um, we got a, a lowest sample uh, uh, standard deviation uh, and for the highest standard deviation we got a poor distribution and for the lowest uh, standard deviation we got a, a best dispersion uh, so here uh, for the one percentage of halocyte nanotube uh, uh, addition we got the best dispersion here And um, here we have done the nearest neighbor distance of HND Cinevaco or HND uh, composites. So the nearest neighbor distance is the distance between each particles and uh, the nearest particles to it. So similar uh, similarity of the position of a uh, single nanotube with the neighboring nanotube. So for uniformly distributed particles in a matrix, the nearest neighbor distribution is narrow. So the ratio of average actual uh, neighbor distance uh, to the average expected neighbor distance is uh, good estimation on this nearest uh, neighbor distance. So um, RK for the average actual neighbor distance RK is calculated using this equation. Summation of one to n di divided by n, where di is a uh, distance between the i particle and its nearest particle, and n is the number of particles. Then uh, we can calculate the expected near nearest neighbor distance E k using the equation 0 0.5 divided by root of n by a where A is the area under study. Okay. And here we, um, we have uh, made a graph with the number of particles and neighboring particles and um, calculate the full width and half uh, maximum. And here the radial distribution of HND is in Ivaco and HND composites are calculated and we got the best distribution in the one percentage and three percentage of uh, halocyte nanotube addition here and we uh, all other uh, percentage have got the poor distribution here and coming to the mechanical properties um, because of the good dispersion there is no stress concentration effect so we got high mechanical properties uh, for this one percentage of nano uh, HNT addition sure. kindly conclude your presentation sure 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 Okay, so uh, it's about 33.2 megapascal of ultimate tensile strength. Uh, so uh, because of this uh, good distribution, we got high mechanical uh, properties. And uh, because of the high crystallinity, also the uh, percentage elongation will be the highest. That is here, it is 930 for the one percentage. Next, uh, it's this SEM micrograph of fracture, uh, fracture surfaces. Uh, first, uh, in the first figure, we can see that it is pure elastic, and uh, we can see the crack uh, propagation tracks over here. And uh, or from from the second figures, we can we can see that um, uh, the the material is become br brittle because of the uh, HNT additions. Okay, and we can see that uh, holes here. This these are the agglomerates. And uh, coming to the last pictures, we can see that uh, this uh, figure is uh, turning its color to gray to white is because of the stress con uh, concentrations. And concluding that uh, this image analysis of SEM EDS maps exposed how well the HNDs are dispersed and distributed in the evacuum matrix. Then the conclusions from the image analysis are in good agreement with the reduction in mechanical and crystalline properties of the composites. The best mechanical properties and crystallinity are observed for the composite with a homogeneous dispersion and distribution of HNDs, which is achieved at one percentage HNT loading. And the crystallinity of evaco is influenced by the presence of, H uh, presence of HNT at low weight fraction, 
which reveals the ability of HNTs as a nucleating agent. So I conclude like this. Thank you, Amal sir, for your brilliant research work. Um, now the session is given queries to the chair. Yeah, what is the basic restriction sir, you have worked on? Structure, basic structure of the material. Hello? Hello? My audible? Sir, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, uh, what is the, what is the basic uh, structure of the HNT uh, that you have worked with? What category of uh, structure it is? Hello? It is actually, a, yeah. it is, a, it, is, it doesn't have a, a well-defined crystal structure. It is a mixture of structures. Amorphous structure or uh, it's amorphous? It is crystalline. It is actually crystalline. So how, how you think uh, this addition is affected? We cannot uh, categorize into any. Okay. Yeah. So we cannot uh, actually categorize into any crystal structure, say, for example. Okay. You have shown the semi images. Yeah, fine, fine. Yeah, you have shown the semi images. And uh, how you uh, shown that uh, white color, what's the meaning of that? You have told the stresses list. How you come to the conclusion? Is there a reference for that? Yes, there is actually, it is based on the Hello? elongation of polymeric chains when you apply the tensile load. So in case of materials with a, a large number of crystallites with small size, and when you pull it, pull it apart, the density of those regions will reduce. That will result in uh, whitened regions okay. in the ACM images. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, sir. Next presentation. Hello. Yes. I have one question, uh, Mr. Amal. Am I audible to you? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. Uh, when you add one percentage halo, uh, halo tube fiber, both tensile strength and elongation break increases simultaneously. And can you explain it? What is the reason for it? Both are increasing simultaneously. Am I clear? Yes. Shall I? OK, OK. The tensile strength and the elongation and break increases simultaneously. Okay, when you add one percentage halo side uh, nanotube, usually when uh, usually uh, uh, when can increase. Can you say the question again? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, when you add uh, one percentage halo side nanotube uh, in the composites, uh, both uh, tens uh, tensile strength and elongation break increases simultaneously. Usually, when you uh, add uh, fiber to the composite, uh, um, usually t elongation break decreases. But in your cases, it is increases. Can you explain it? So actually, with the, the nanofillers, the crystallinity of the former matrix will increase. So here we are seeing a semi-crystalline polymer. And uh, by the addition of HNDs, the crystallinity is increased. Actually, we studied uh, the crystallinity of these composites as well, and we haven't reported it here. So actually, for one percentage filler loading, it is the highest. OK, OK. So because of that, both the tensile strength as well as the percentage elongation. Usually, as uh, crystallinity increases, elongation break decreases. In most of the cases, it will be like this. That's why I'm asking. Sorry. OK. Thank you for your presentation, sir. Moving on to the next presentation, we have Jagav G. R. from SMS School of Engineering and Technology, Karuti. is going to give his presentation on his paper entitled on Characterization and Analysis of 
fe co based uh, hybrid composites so please good afternoon uh, my name is sujit uh, instead of raghav sir i am going to present i am the co author of co author of the paper uh, so sir can i present sure You can present. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, is this presentation visible? It's visible. Okay. So our work is characterization and analysis of iron cobalt-based hybrid composites. so these are the team members now moving on to the abstract in this study the powder metallurgy process has been made use for making for making the iron uh, cobalt based hybrid composites for here the different compositions of chromium hybrid based composites were tested for its tribological properties so here the mechanical properties of the hybrid composites were studied to get an understanding about the durability of the composites with different compositions of the chromium now uh, different properties were studied that is the wear analysis the corrosion analysis and the hardness analysis of this mixture was studied then for wear analysis the pin on disc apparatus was used and also the corrosion analysis was done using the weight loss method the microstructure analysis were also performed for the hybrid composite material to understand the role of the material constituents then after the analysis of the worn out surface it was observed that the wear happens initially due to the abrasion followed by the plastic deformation characteristic studies studies were done with the help of scanning electron microscope now a significant variation in the corrosion rate and wear rate was observed with the varying compositions of the chromium that is the chromium content uh, the increase in chromium content improves the different properties that is corrosion resistance and also the wear rate the properties tend to get better with a higher concentration of chromium in the composites now the higher chromium content improve the wear resistance as well as the corrosion resistance now moving on to the methodology so the iron cobalt materials were used in this study and they were purchased from mepco limited tamil nadu the alloying of the hybrid composites was done through mechanical ball milling process where the duration of the process was 2 hours and the material was compacted into a cylindrical shape which is 8 mm in dimension the compaction pressure was in the range of 7520 megapascal then after that the sintering process was done for the hardening of the soft compacts the duration of sintering was 2 hours and it is it was done at a temperature of 1000 degrees celsius the microstructure analysis of the hybrid composites were done using a field emission scanning electron microscope then with the help of universal testing machine the compressive strength of the hybrid composite made Hello, Sujit. Hello, Hello Sujit. Uh, you are not audible right now. Hello. Yes, you are audible. 
सर माय कनेक्शन हैज लो हैज बी लॉस्ट सो कैन आई रेस्यूम द प्रेजेंटेशन यस यस यू कैन ओके ओके सर ओके सर इज दिस विजिबल एस एस so please okay. make it faster okay 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 sir so the weight analysis test was uh, for different solutions then the pin on disc apparatus consists of a pin which is either flat or spherical in shape the pin is connected to a stiff arm and is rubbed against a disc of non hardness value so the hardness value was 65 hrc the sample was rotated at a selected speed and the wear rates for pin and disc were calculated from the weight of the material removed during the test now moving on to the results and discussion those so the images obtained from sem is shown here below so in the figure it is seen that the cobalt has an agglomerated structure the particle size was found to be 500 nanometer the morphology of iron was shown in the figure 1 whereas in figure 1b it is very clear that the chromium has a flake like structure and the particle size was 20 micrometer then in figure c it is shown that the morphology of the iron particles so it is evident from the image that the iron is spherical mostly spherical in shape and it is also seen agglomerated and the particle size value was 20 micrometer now moving on to the next result that is a wear analysis so here in the figure it is shown the wear analysis uh, it, uh, when when we are uh, looking at this figure uh, it is we are not able to see your presentation Could you please check? Sir, now it's visible. Yes, now it's visible. You uh, please try to conclude. Okay, yeah. sir. Okay, sir. Okay. so this is the wear analysis so in this figure it is seen that with the percentage of the chromium increase the wear rate is reduced so the uh, it is evident from the figure that the 10 with 10 percentage chromium has most resistance to the wear so this is the figure with the figure it is clear that the and also the coefficient of friction value decreases with the increase in the uh, chromium value then the next one is the corrosion analysis so the three figures of different solution that three percentage nacl 0.1 hcl and 0.1 h2so4 the results are shown so in this figure it is shown that with the increase in the percentage uh, the properties are enhanced or the corrosion and corrosion resistance increases with the in addition of the chromium then the least value was observed when the solution was three percentage nacl and the value was found to be 0.001 then these are the micro hardness density and the compressive strength property so here also the different properties had been enhanced with the addition of the chromium and that is shown in the figure then these are the values for different uh, addition of the chromium what are the variation in the density micro hardness and the compressive strength then the conclusion so in the conclusion the iron hybrid composites were studied and the mechanical wear and corrosion properties were reported the addition of chromium resulted in an increase in the micro hardness property the compressive strength improved considerably the density has improved considerably with the addition of chromium the wear resistance of the iron cobalt hybrid compress composites has been improved and also the corrosion resistance have been improved thank you uh session is over for queries if you have any queries you can ask to him now any queries i hope there is no queries thank you sujit for your good work Moving Please. on to the next presentation. Um, next we have uh, Raghav G R. Oh, sorry. Um, next we have Manoj Kumar P from K P R Institute of Engineering and Technology, Coimbatore. Is going to give his presentation on his paper entitled "On Investigation Investigating Pro uh, Performance of Solar Photovoltaic Using a Nano Phase Change Material." So please.
Anybody from the team is present here? Is ready to present your paper? From KPR Institute of Engineering Technology, Coimbatore. Okay. Uh, on due time, we are moving to the next presentation. Moving on to the next presentation, we have Jibin George from SEMS School of Engineering and Technology, Karuvitti. He's going to give his presentation on his paper entitled on Effect of Nanofilters on Crystalline and Mechanical Properties of EVACO Polymer Nanocomposites. So please. Okay, thank you and good morning to all. Uh, so I hope I'm audible. This is Anub. I'm one of the co-authors from the paper. So let me uh, present my slide. I hope my slide is visible. Okay. So uh, we have this research work of uh, a study basically on the effect of nanofillers on the crystalline and mechanical properties of Evaco, which is a polymer. And the whole intention is to create a whole new nano composites. So, so myself, T. M. Anupamar, and uh, these are my uh, uh, fellow co-authors. So, uh, as an overview, we have a, a small introduction. Then uh, we'll be speaking of uh, certain materials which are used. Then the preparation of the composites. Then uh, the basic uh, characterization, and finally moving on to the results and dissertation, followed by conclusions. Now the polymer nanocomposites are finding new applications in replacing the conventional polymers from household to advanced engineering. Now for this, nanofillers from various sources are commonly used as fillers in the polymer nanocomposites. The nanofillers have superior mechanical properties and often these are used in polymers which have poor mechanical characteristics. Now, the addition of the nanomaterials in this polymer matrix can impart certain unique properties, some of which I've mentioned over here, like the crystallinity, thermal de degradation, the tensile strength, etc. And this will enhance the poor mechanical and also the other properties of a uh, common polymer. Now, moreover, in nanocomposites, the properties of the polymers and the nanofillers are compromised and they exhibit superior properties as uh, when combined as a single material. And also, even very a uh, small quantity of the nanofiller is just sufficient to make a significant impact on the properties of the polymer matrix. So we have various nanofillers. These are some of the examples like carbon nanotubes, clay, nanocellulose. And over here, we have used basically three nanofillers, which I'll be discussing in the coming slide. Now, the basic matrix material of this nanocomposite is a polymer, which is called the Evaco, ethylene cope vinyl acetate. And this is having a, a, a polar uh, nature. And to this, we are adding nanofillers to Im improve the strength of this Evaco polymer. And three nanofillers are used, and the uh, results are actually compared in the uh, coming slides okay so uh, the three nanofillers which are used over here are halocyte nanotubes hnt alumina trihydrate nanoparticles nano ath and multi walled carbon nanotubes mwcnt and these three nanofillers are basically added to the evaco the polymer matrix and the uh, crystalline and the mechanical properties are basically compared. Now, Evaco is uh, semi-crystalline and it is having a good uh, adhesion property, mainly used in uh, the paints and all. And to Im improve the strength of and the mechanical properties of Evaco, we are adding the following uh, nanofillers. Each one is having a different property, like uh, the ATH, it is having a flame retarding property and this, it is also an excellent smoke uh, suppressant likewise and uh, uh, 
the non polar nature of mwcnt it is basically made converted to polar by treating uh, by chemically treating it with uh, uh, some polar groups and uh, the surface is basically modified to make it polar so that the nanofiller will combine or will join with the evaco polymer and the uh, hydrogen hydrogen bonding it's basically formed now the basic preparation of the composite it is discussed over here now to fabricate the composites a predetermined quantity of evaco was dissolved in dcm which is dichloromethane by continuous mixing using a, a magnetic stirrer and into this the nanofiller is added for example hnt it is one of the nanofillers so it is added slowly and it is mixed thoroughly by vigorous uh, stirring and subsequent ultrasonic methods so first of all we'll be mixing it uh, mixing it with magnetic stirring and after that we will go for ultrasonification and this mixture it is then poured into petri dishes and it is allowed to dry to form the respective composite films now the composite films are then uh, dried at room temperatures and then in a vacuum oven at 50 degree centigrade for over 6 hours now these is the uh, this slide uh, actually uh, briefs the characterization that is the various test and all which is being conducted to examine the uh, composites now the mechanical properties it was tested by conducting the tensile test and the specimens all the specimens were uh, uh, prepared using the standard and the fracture analysis were done then finally 10 images were taken and to study the crystallinity the xrd diffraction was conducted now moving on to the results first of all the morphology of the fillers now the highest as as aspect ratio it was observed in the nano composites with mwcnt followed by the hnt nano particles and then the least was observed for nano ath and we have uh, uh, the reason for that why mwcnt showed the maximum high aspect ratio and also the surface structure of mwcnt was observed to be smoother than that of the other two nano fillers now basically speaking of the crystallinity of the nano composites the high polar nature of the nano fillers actually forms the uh, crystalline nature more the polar nature of the nano fillers more will be the crystalline nature and more the crystalline nature more will be the strength of the material so actually the crystallinity will increase the uh, mechanical properties of the composite now as the filler roding it is increased the crystallinity basically uh, it gets increased to a certain amount that is still 1 percentage loading of ath and hnt whereas it was only 0.1 weight percentage in the case of mwcnt and after this value the the crystallinity actually, actually it decreases as the fillers uh, they tend sir, to form uh, sorry for interrupting kindly conclude the session sir okay it formed agglomerations and these were the results which were observed for filler roding the maximum crystallinity for all the three nano fillers and the mechanical properties also it was observed in these cases in nano ath for one percentage filler roding both the ultimate tensile strength and the toughness was uh, maximized and for hnt it was 1 percentage filler roding whereas for mwcnt it was 0.05 percentage only and these are the images uh, the tem images of uh, one case pure evaco in figure a 1 percentage in figure b and 10 percentage in the third figure so when we see the amount of filler roding increasing the agglomeration of the particles it is observed by uh, that white uh, colored uh, faces which are being formed and the more the agglomerates lower will be the tensile strength so as the filler loading increases the material will be, will be becoming more brittle in nature so these are the conclusions made uh, the conclusions are made on the mechanical properties and we have got one percentage uh, the uh, filler loading as the maximum strength for both ath and hnt whereas 0.05 for mwcnt and also from the fractography analysis the conclusion made us that the brittle nature of the composites tend to increase at higher filler loadings so thank you the session uh, thank you sir the session has given queries to the chair is tanu am i audible yes ma'am you are audible 
ഓക്കെ യു ഹാവ് യൂസ്ഡ് എച്ച് എൻ ടി എ ടി എച്ച് ആൻഡ് എം ഡി എം ഡി സി എൻ ടി ഫൈബേഴ്സ് ഫോർ കോമ്പോസിറ്റ് പ്രിപ്പറേഷൻ ഹിയർ ഐ വുഡ് ലൈക്ക് ടു നോ എമങ് ദീസ് വിച്ച് ഫില്ലർ ഈസ് ഗുഡ് വൺ ഫോർ ഗുഡ് വൺ ഫോർ മെക്കാനിക്കൽ റീൻഫോഴ്സ്മെന്റ് it is actually modified as mwcnt okay okay uh, um, can you explain the cost effective uh, effectiveness of the composites since uh, mwcnt is are expensive it it could be more uh, actually mwcnt reinforced composite may be more costly but the percentage of mwcnt to achieve the same mechanical property as compared to ath and hnt uh, better uh, mechanical properties is less okay only a small fraction okay, of mwcnt okay 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 thank you okay. any other queries ah uh, okay anu thank you any other queries thank you for your presentation moving on to next presentation we have abdul zubair hamid from king abdul aziz university jeddah saudi arabia he is going to give his presentation on his paper entitled on an investigation report on sustainable strength of amalgamation materials so please hello okay we can move on to the next paper thank you anu okay moving on to next presentation we have prasanna pk from acharya nagarjuna university guntur andhra pradesh going to give on his presentation strength and uh, on his paper entitled on strength and durability of fiber reinforced concrete with partial replacement of cement by ground granulated blast furnace lag please uh, sorry for the interruption uh, abdul subar hamid is here hello yeah. abdul subar hamid from king abdul as university jeddah saudi arabia okay then come on so seems the next group also is absent from ajaria nag nagarjuna university prasanna pk okay then move on to the next paper we have on the next presentation we have rakesh km from jss science and technology university mysuru is going to give on his, uh, give a presentation on his paper entitled on investigation on acoustic properties thermal stabilities and water sorption abilities of finger millet straw fibers darba fibers and ripe blurge fibers so please so good afternoon everyone so let me start by sharing my screen is my screen visible to all yes sir screen okay. is visible So my name is Rakesh I am a research scholar in JSS Science and Technology University Mysuru My research work is on the natural fibers for development of acoustical materials so basically here in this paper I am concentrating on three basic natural fibers namely finger millet straw fiber darba fiber and ripe bulrush fibers so here I am going to discuss about their acoustical properties thermal stabilities and water sorption abilities My presentation contains a brief introduction to sound, noise, and some terminologies associated with acoustics, like uh, sound absorption coefficient, noise reduction coefficient, which are which I will be using in my discussions. Then I will be discussing about the fiber properties and uh, chemical composition of the fibers, followed by the methodology that I have used for the research. then i briefly explain about the testing samples uh, preparation for testing and uh, result analysis followed by the conclusion so as you all know sound is a vibration energy that propagates in any medium 
as an acoustic wave. So the medium could be solid, liquid, or gas. So and we hear this vibrational energy as sound because of the uh, working of our ears. So uh, if you consider any human beings, the audible range is considered to be from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So 20 hertz is the lower limit and 20,000 hertz is the upper limit. Some human beings are sensible. Uh, they have the sensibility to hear less than 20 and more than 20,000 hertz. But most of the general human beings are able to hear in this range. And this varies, audible range varies for different animals. And coming to noise, and we can say that noise is the unwanted sound. So basically noise is a relative and a subjective term, which depends upon the situation and the person where we are considering, uh, depending upon the time and situation, sound becomes noise in a short way, if I can say. So here I will be explaining two concepts, like one is sound absorption coefficient and one is noise reduction coefficient. So the first one, sound absorption coefficient. So let's consider two medium. And we have a layer of material between the two uh, mediums. When sound energy gets incident on the surface of the material, a part of the incident energy gets reflected and the remaining energy is transmitted through the material to second medium. So while the energy gets transmitted through the media material, a part of it and a part of the energy is lost in the form of heat due to viscous damping and the rest is transmitted. This energy for an acoustical material will be very less. So basically an ac acoustical material or a sound absorbing material is the one which absorbs most of the incident energy and only transmit a few of it. So absorption coefficient is nothing but uh, it's a ratio of incident sound energy, absorbed energy to the incident energy. And we have the relative formulas here. Next coming to noise reduction coefficient. So this absorption coefficient is uh, for all the frequencies from starting from 50 hertz to say, say from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, we can have this individual absorption coefficients. For the better understanding and analysis, we will consider frequencies at 500, 1000, 2000 and 4000. And we take the average of that and that we call it as noise reduction coefficient. Why we do that? Because uh, in general case, sound absorption of any material is good or higher at higher frequencies and we have a problem at lower frequencies. That's why we are considering 500 to 4000 as critical and we consider this noise reduction coefficient for the studies. Next, moving on to fiber details. So here I've considered three fibers as I mentioned before, finger millet, darba and ripul. So from the literature review, I could find that most of the researchers have worked on the nutritive value, medicinal values and animal feedstock the straws from the that we get from the harvested fingal millet that can be used as a animal feedstock. So I thought of exploring uh, this um, finger millet for development of acoustical material. Similarly, this darba grass you, you can find in uh, the literature in Ayurveda and Yunani for the drug analysis, drug authentication, and is found to be a good antimicrobial properties. And darba ripple is being used for some composite material manufacturing and automobile applications. So basically I'm going to consider these three fibers for the rest of my studies in this paper. Moving on to the chemical composition. So chemical composition of any natural fibers plays a critical role for understanding its physical properties. Say we consider its thermal properties or water absorption properties. These contents are very crucial, which I shall explain in the coming slides. So the methodology that I've used, so I've considered three fibers and I've done alkali treatment for a day that is 10% alkalization for all the three fibers. Among them, darba and ripul fibers were directly used for sample preparation for acoustical testing, whereas the finger millet straws were used, were further chemical treated and two types of chemical treatments, namely benzylation and peroxide were performed on the finger millet straws. The reason being that when I did the uh, alkalization for finger millet, I couldn't extract the fibers. So for better understanding and sample preparation and analysis, I need a fiber. So I just performed these two to get the fibers and to study further. So finally, for testing, I have four different inputs. One is two types of finger millet straws that is benzylated. BMF and peroxide treated finger millet straw that is PMF. These are the abbreviations that I am using. 
Derba fibers and rifle brush, uh, rifle brush fibers are directly used after alkalization. So these samples, four samples were tested for 10 mm sample thickness. Acoustic, uh, acoustical properties were explored for 10 mm sample thickness. Further, based on the results, two fibers were selected for further analysis with an increase in sample thickness of 20 mm. And those two fibers were again studied for the thermal stability and sorption studies. Moving on to sample preparation. So acoustical testing is basically performed in an impedance tube where we place a sample and have a normal incidence for measuring the sound absorption coefficient of any specimen. So the impedance tube that we used had a two diameters, one is 29.5 mm and 99.5 mm. So basically with 29.5 mm we can measure high frequencies and with 99.5 mm we can measure low frequencies. So uh, this is about the testing uh, device that I am using. And coming to the chemical, the photos of the chemical treatment, as I discussed. Uh, in the sir, uh, kindly mind them. Okay, I will just move on to my results. Okay, sir. Okay, kindly mind. Okay, fine. Just give me two minutes. So moving on to sound absorption coefficient. So this is uh, we plotted uh, sound. The y-axis is the absorption coefficient and x-axis is the frequencies. So as I told earlier, BMF, PMF, and DF, RF, these are the four samples. So the corresponding NRCs are found to be 0.91. And um, PMF and DMF were selected for further studies. The reason being that DF and RF, even though they are having same NRC, there is no literature for DF. And DF was found to be more promising in terms of its uh, durability. So the samples were again tested for sample thickness of 20 mm. And there was a shift increase in the absorption from 0.24 to 0.44 for PMF and from 0.23 to 0.38 for RDF, Derba fibers. So thermal studies were also performed. So as I told, mentioned before, like chemical composition plays a critical role. In the first stage, moisture was lost in the range of 25 to 1,600. In second stage, uh, semilose, hemicellulose, and lignin was lost. And in the final stage, remaining components were lost. So these are the views or of, uh, test results of thermal studies. Moving on to morphological studies. So here we can find the fiber porosity. And here we can find the measure the diameters. And here we can find the surface roughness using the same studies. And then we have a uh, sorption studies. So sorption studies uh, basically was performed for four. One is PMF and DF are chemically treated and the same were uh, used for the untreated, like untreated finger millet and untreated darba were also used for understanding what is the effect of chemical treatment on water absorption of the properties. And it was found that chemical treatment would enhance the resistance for water absorption. So I would like to conclude my presentation by saying that like uh, among the four types of finger, uh, four types of samples that were tested for uh, thickness of 10 mm, PMF and DMF, PMF and DF were uh, found to be better and they were further analyzed for sample thickness of 20 mm. So there was a shift in increase in the absorption quotient as the sample thickness increased from 10 to 20 mm. Finally, thermal studies and uh, from water sorption studies, we found that PMF, that is peroxide treated finger millet straws are more stable thermally and water sorptionally. So we use that for, uh, we propose that material for any interior acoustical applications. These are the references that I've used. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The session is given queries to the chair. Yes, please. The session is open for queries. Hello. Hello, ma'am. OK. Uh, have you measured cellulose content, hemicellulose content, and lignin content, and all? Actually, uh, since I am a mechanical engineer, I took one of the help help from one of my co-authors, so to okay. do the testing and all. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, actually, you have prepared uh, cellulose fibers from three sources, and uh, according to which is no, good actually, one. No, actually, yes, ma'am, correct. Please carry on. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. You have you uh, prepared three uh, type of uh, fibers, cellulose fibers from three sources, right? Correct, ma'am. Which is good one. Uh, yeah, that's what. Uh, uh, the chemically treated finger millet was found to be good because uh, it has good acoustical properties, it has good thermal stability, and also it has less water absorption. So 
considering these three parameters i saw, um, conclude that like uh, peroxide treated finger millet was found to be better than darba and uh, raipur okay okay thank you thank you ragesh it was a wonderful presentation thank you ma'am any other questions any other queries okay thank you okay thank you for your presentation moving on to next presentation we have anandan d tampi from college of engineering thruvandrum is going to give his presentation on his paper entitled on the effect of nanoparticle additives on tribological properties of various lubricating oils so please so you are inaudible hello hello am i audible yeah yes yes you are audible right now okay the title is uh, uh, actually anandan is not available myself anand ap will take the presentation the uh, it is the title is the uh, effect of nanoparticular additives on the tribological properties of various lubricating oils actually this is a, a review work of many papers and the contents will be introduction mechanism of nanoparticles and uh, nanoparticles are additives in various base oils and uh, conclusion then reference uh, as an introduction i like to say about uh, that our, uh, today uh, we are focusing on uh, more eco friendly lubricants uh, because of this uh, environmental impacts caused by the uh, mineral oil uh, usage uh, because that environmental pollution and various health issues and also uh, this instead of this uh, mineral oil we can use as uh, vegetable and synthetic oil as a, a eco friendly nature because of their eco friendly nature uh, they are excellent lubricant properties and uh, viscosity index like that mm, uh, for uh, in this paper uh, we mainly focus on uh, for uh, developing uh, bio lubricant and also uh, uh, the effect of nanoparticles on them uh, to improve this tribology properties uh, of uh, such a way that um, for this review work we are selected uh, so many papers with mineral oils vegetable oils and synthetic oils uh, and and their uh, nano uh, in which the uh, nanoparticle addition uh, also takes place and coming to the next slide this mechanism of nanoparticles uh, during this uh, uh, addition uh, nanoparticle addition to this uh, various oils uh, there are mainly uh, from this work uh, we got the mainly four types of uh, we can uh, say that four mechanism is there that is first is uh, Uh, yeah, a small uh, spherical nanoparticles they when they uh, during the lubrication the small nanoparticles will uh, roll between this uh, friction surface and they convert the sliding friction to rolling friction and, uh, as we know that uh, the rolling friction is less than sliding friction and also uh, this nanoparticle will pull the contact surface thereby uh, reducing the surface roughness and the next one is that uh, this nanoparticle when during this lubrication nanoparticle acts as some physical film and which will compensate for the material mass loss and also this nanoparticle will form a protective layer that is the fourth fourth one protective layer between the friction beds that's why uh, during the uh, contact uh, or the mo uh, sliding motion the friction will be reduced and also uh, from the work uh, uh, it is we, we got that this shape size crystal structure and the dispersion of the nanoparticles also plays an important role in this uh, like uh, there are many uh, we know that there are some uh, dispersion uh, methods like stirring with mechanical mechanical stirring using and also uh, ultrasonication like that now moving to the next uh, slide this uh, nanoparticles are additives in various base oils uh, this actually this table uh, consists of most of my work uh, of these papers uh, actually due to this time limitation i am skipping this uh, this table consists of uh, uh, different uh, oils and their nanoparticle composition uh, and the which the tribo uh, tribo uh, tribological studies used and also our findings I'm actually going to skip this. Moving to the next slide, I will explain uh, summary of some recent papers I have selected. First one is uh, this multi-layered uh, molybdenum disulfide and carbon nano nano species high performance additives in lubricating oils. Uh, in this, uh, this uh, the nanoparticle is modified uh, nanoparticle. Uh, this uh, it is synthesized using hydrothermal method. 
Mm, actually, this uh, molybdenum disulfide is altered with carbon to form these nanospheres. And they are uh, about, uh, this average size was about uh, 40 nanometer. And the concentration uh, easily is 0.015 to 0.1 weight percentage. And the lubricant, lubricant uh, selected was industrial lubricant oil. And the tribology study was, it was a uh, laboratory setup uh, by that is uh, conducting couples in control media. Uh, then the uh, uh, remarks is, uh, we got, uh, that they got uh, the friction coefficient was reduced from 0.281 to 0.198 is uh, for the 0.1 weight percentage. Uh, the next paper is uh, tribological analysis of neem oil during the addition of uh, silicon dioxide nanoparticle at different loads. Uh, uh, here the nanoparticle size was 15 to 30 mm, that is silicon dioxide, and the concentration range was 0 0.15 to 0.9 weight percentage. Uh, the lubricant oil was neem oil, and the tribal test was pinned on this tribometer. And there was a um, after that is uh, 0.3 per weight percentage as shown, better lubricity. And after that, 0.3 percentage, the wear was increased. And the next paper was uh, synthesis of tribalgy behavior of oil soluble uh, copper nanoparticle additives in uh, SF15W40. Uh, that's a motor, uh, commercial motor oil, um, the lubricating oil. Then the nano additive here was used for copper nanoparticle with spherical shapes. And the concentration range was 0 0.2 to 1 percentage in mass fraction. Uh, and the tribal study was done by uh, Balondis UMT tester. And the, uh, the best additive concentration was found to be 0 0.8 percentage for this paper. And the next paper was that uh, effect of uh, zinc oxide uh, nanoparticle uh, concentration as additives the epoxy uh, uvidia leather is oil and their tribology addressing here the oil is modified using epoxidation method and the uh, nanoparticle as used in a concentration range of 0.2 to 0.8 weight percentage and the tribal study was used uh, using the pinot de cmg tester uh, uh, after the addition of uh, so remarks after addition of 0.5 weight percentage and there is a viscosity increase, viscosity index increase uh, about 3.17 percentage, and also uh, there is a reduction in coefficient pressure wear by 8.23 percent, 5.13 percentage. And uh, then moving to the next slide, I need to conclude this uh, my work. You know, that is a uh, uh, more uh, we uh, in most of this work, the nano uh, the nanoparticle uh, was an uh, effective anti wear additive for bioluminescent form formation, and also the friction also improved. And the wear also is most most of the nanoparticles, and also uh, there was an about the friction reduction about uh, three uh, three to fifty percent by the addition of 0 0.1 weight percent to 0 0.25 weight percent. This was a uh, was found to be ideal concentration. Uh, the uh, also the re review paper said that the usage of formous nanoparticles and antioxidants, antioxidants along with the nanoparticles can further improve the fibrosis properties when compared to nanoparticle alone. And the further studies are required for this uh, dispersion stability, synthesis, and economical feasibility of nano lubricants. And this is my acknowledgement. And these are the reference. Hello. Uh, session is open for queries. Uh, Anandu, am I audible? Ah, yes, yes. What is the size of nanoparticle you used? Uh, there are different sizes. Actually, this is a, a review paper of many uh, research papers. Okay. Uh, so, average uh, size, we can talk about 40 nanometer. 40 nanometer? Yes, yeah, average. Okay, okay. Then how do you optimize uh, these? What? If you are going to prepare a lubricating oil with nanoparticle, what are the uh, methods for the optimization? Actually, uh, I do this re review paper for uh, my thesis work. Uh, as I have, from this uh, work, I have selected uh, some nanoparticle, that is copper nanoparticle I have selected. Okay. And also, uh, for, uh, actually, I am doing uh, this tribological uh, actually I'm doing this tribological test. Uh, sir, I didn't understand the question. Like, okay, that is uh, that is depend upon the effectiveness of the lubricating oil used, right? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, fine. Uh, is there any other queries? Uh, 
i hope there is uh, no queries thank you thank you anu thank you anantu for the work okay so uh, we are wind up the track one uh, for noon contributory oral presentation sessions will resume to our uh, session by 2 o'clock with the keynote lecture of professor harris macasaurus professor sustainable manufacturing system kings college london uk so uh, kindly be joined by 2 o'clock followed by there will be a contributory oral presentations followed by the keynote lectures thank you all thank you all for attending the inauguration and followed by the contributory oral presentation session thank you